morning. I'm Sally Bagshaw, and welcome to our October 22nd Budget Committee. Thank you all for being here, and special thanks to Council Central staff for not only putting up with us, but trying to deal with all of the Form A's that came your way, knowing that Form B's are right on the heels, but I really appreciate the great analysis that you have done. Um, thank you to our audience members. Glad you're here. Um, thank you for your pea patch op-ed last week. I thought it was excellent. Uh, you know public comment is going to come at the end of all of this, so happy that you're here, but um, just wanted you to know that it may be a little bit of time. So today we are focusing on the miscellaneous items. And as Councilmember Gonzalez pointed out on Monday, we have 20 different department and offices that are going to be bringing forward miscellaneous items. So I expect that this will probably go past noon today. Thank you all for coming and for uh, participating and hanging in here with us. So yesterday, you know that we heard uh, from uh, our Council Central staff on items that affected criminal justice. I want to say thanks to our elected Judge Shadid from Municipal Court who was here with us yesterday and took the time to make a short presentation. Also, we heard about the police department issues. Thank you, Greg Doss, for your excellent memo. I appreciated that very much. So today we're diving into the things that didn't fall neatly into a single department. And I'm excited and happy to get forward with that. Um, I think, Asha, you're going to kick it off. Is that right? Do, do you want to tell us anything about that brown cow thing you were talking about? Or should we just skip that and keep on going? Let's just skip that part. Great. And also to remind folks that tonight is our second public hearing. It starts at 5.30. Sign-ups begin at 4.30 here in City Hall. And we look forward to hearing everybody's comments and suggestions on our budget to date. Buckle up. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a long night. Yeah. Oh, but our, we're looking forward to hearing from everyone on these issues. Okay, so let's just dive in. Asha, I think that um, you, uh, Lisa, thank you for being here at the table um, uh, throughout the last couple of weeks, but also being here today. So if you want to just dive in, we are ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to note, you did uh, mention that we will have brief presentations from 20 departments and offices, or for on budgets for 20 departments and offices. Um, I would say this might be similar to the NPR Tiny Desk Concerts, except without the music. Um, Central Somebody in the back. You've got a chorus behind you, so we're expecting... That, yes, yes. I expect some humming to be exactly. taking place. Um, Central Staff Leads for each budget will describe any issues that they've flagged for your consideration, and they'll also highlight uh, any um, issues that have been identified by council members. Great. Um, Asha wheedled her way to the front of the line, and we'll start with presentations on the arts, the city attorney's office, and Seattle IT. Good. Thank you. Okay. So I will dive into the Office of Arts and Culture here to kick us off. Um, the Office of Arts and Culture has about a $15 million uh, proposed budget this year. Um, it is an increase of about $828,000 over the 2020 endorsed budget. It accounts for about $280,000 of annual wage increase um, in this tentative agreement between the city and the Coalition of Unions. It would add three FTEs, um, one community impact and assessment manager, a community outreach and engagement position, and also an executive assistant uh, at a cost of about $432,000. And lastly, the budget increase accounts for $90,000 in ongoing funding for security services at King Street Station. I just note that arts is funded by uh, admissions tax funds, as well as 1% for arts contributions, uh, specifically for um, capital projects. If there are, there are no issues identified for arts, so if there are no questions, I can move into the actions proposed by council members. Right. Thank you. I was thinking, okay. hmm, I hope uh, you didn't first, skip that one, especially the first one. <laughs> the first is to add $25,000 to support uh, History Link, and this is Council Member Bagshaw. Great. Thank you so much. And colleagues, I am asking that we add $25,000 to support History Link. Um, this action would add a, an admission tax fund to the city's annual contract with HistoryLink. HistoryLink, as you know, provides free online access to historic Seattle resources. It's a one-of-a-kind organization, as far as I know. And they helped us with this beautiful book, The Seattle at 150. Uh, and I want to say thanks to Monica Martinez-Simmons again and to her staff for making this happen. So for $25,000, we will help Marie McCaffrey sustain this organization and continue to help us note the wonderful historic things that have happened in our city and make sure that people remember them. 
The second item is to add $25,000 to support racial equity and arts alignment. This is sponsored by Council Member Harrell. Um, this action is intended to fund an organization that serves artists of colors, excuse me, artists of color, immigrants, and other communities that are experiencing structural oppression uh, to help explore strategies for racial justice and equity in the arts community. And this is intended to be one-time funding. Good, and is this gonna be part of a competitive process, do you know, Asha? I don't believe or that- Or is it going to one single organization? Uh, I believe that this would be going to an organization that does this work. I don't believe it is intended to be split amongst uh, different organizations. Thank you, we can ask Council President Harrell when he arrives. Uh, if there are no other questions about arts, I can move into the city attorney's office. I'm not seeing any other questions. Thank you. Okay. So the city attorney's office, which I might refer to as law, um, is counsel to the city, a prosecutor in Seattle Municipal Court, and provides legal advice to elected officials. Uh, their budget this year is about $34 million, uh, an increase of 13.9% over the endorsed budget. The change is of an increase of about $4.1 million, and that accounts for um, a cut that was um, maintained in the 2020 endorsed budget um, that is being added back into the law department's, um, excuse me, the law department's budget. Uh, it accounts for an additional $100,000 that is going to go to the pre, is proposed to go to the pre-filing diversion program to expand the number of workshops from six to 12 that that program uh, contracts with Choose 184. Um, and it also adds funding for already approved reclassifications and paralegal positions, um, as well as $1.7 million to account for the annual wage increase. The budget itself adds seven and a half FTEs it adds three assistant city attorneys to the civil division to increase um, reliance in-house and decrease our uh, reliance on outside councils, outside council, and that's anticipated to save the department about a million dollars annually. It adds an, an assistant city prosecutor position in the criminal division to address case backlogs and backfill gaps uh, that are created by the new leave policies that are now in place in the city. It includes a personnel specialist to handle increased work, human resources workload. And then it accounts for memorandums of understanding that law has been uh, partnering with other departments to provide legal assistance um, over the past couple years. And now they are moving these otherwise off book sort of positions and funding agreements into the new budgeting system. If are they actually, and maybe you're about to get to this, but are they actually moving the lawyers into the department? So like you say, an assistant city attorney to help with the Office of Housing, will that uh, attorney be located in OH? So and they're then, actually located in the city attorney's office. It's just work that um, the funding comes from um, interdepartmental agreements right. um, for the departments to fund those positions. Okay, but they're staying with the city attorney's office physically, yes. but they'll be focused on that particular work. That's correct. Okay, can I ask you a question going back to the three new uh, assistant city attorneys in the civil division to decrease reliance on outside counsel? One of the arguments that I've heard from our city attorney is the reason for outside counsel is that we, f we find ourselves in situations that require specialization and you can't predict what, special, what specialty is necessarily going to crop up. How, is, how are we going to be assured if we spend money on three new assistant city attorneys that we are truly going to reduce the outside legal counsel? So I believe the idea is that this would be um, not necessarily for those issues that require, um, always require expertise outside of the city attorney's office. That's definitely a factor, um, but it's essentially to staff up um, the, the civil division so that um, when there are issues that come up that are a matter of staffing capacity, which is the reason we sometimes go to outside counsel, that that, that level of uh, reliance on outside counsel is no longer the case. That's my current understanding. I'm happy to follow up with um, the department to get okay. uh, a little more information. Good, thank you, I wish you would. Thank you, I hadn't heard from the city attorney about this, so I just would love to have a little more information. Absolutely. Um, if there are no, so there are no identified issues for the city attorney's office. Um, so we can move into actions proposed by council members. If there are no other questions. Good. No. Um, council member Gonzalez, do you want to just dive in on your, your add the 500,000 to create police accountability agency legal fund? Uh, sure. Happy to do that. I wasn't sure if, um, we wanted to give Asha an opportunity to describe them first, or if I just want to dig in, whatever, whatever we want to. Uh, I, you know I'm what? happy to do a short description if that's helpful. Okay. 
Do you want me just Jeff, why don't you just dive in? I think okay. that I think this woman on my right has it handled. <laughs> um, Asha does too. She's very capable. Um, okay, so this request would propose creating a police accountability agency legal fund in the amount of a total of five hundred thousand dollars. This uh, is an identified and un identified ongoing need to fund legal services for the uh, police accountability um, partners, and um, it has been made uh, very apparent in this particular year um, that uh, the city and the Seattle Police Department are going to remain under the federal consent decree as it relates to issues of police accountability for at least the next two years in light of the court's uh, recent orders related to uh, being only partially in compliance, specifically as it relates to uh, the accountability ordinance. So uh, we expect that uh, the Community Police Commission, the Office of Police Accountability, and that the Office of Inspector General will continue to have uh, legal needs related to the consent decree um, and will need to be able to readily and easily access appropriate legal services to be able to um, have their independent perspectives represented in those proceedings. So I expect that this will continue to be a need over the next couple of years. And there's been some struggles from their perspective in terms of how they are currently able to or not able to access um, legal services directly through the city attorney's office. So of course, our accountability ordinance, which we passed in May of 2017, contemplated a situation in which the uh, police accountability uh, agencies might need to seek their own um, uh, legal uh, counsel um, in that um, it was laid out specifically in the accountability ordinance under section 3.29.480 which provided that when due to a conflict of interest, lack of technical expertise or capacity reasons, the city's attorney, the city attorney's office declines to provide legal re representation to an oversight entity in any legal matter, enforcement action or court proceeding. The city attorney shall so indicate to the oversight entity in writing with the reason for the decline representation and that oversight entity shall be entitled to representation by private legal counsel. Um, so that the ordinance goes on to sort of lay out uh, who the private legal counsel can be. Um, it also provides in here that the city shall provide sufficient funding for the legal services separate from the oversight entity's operational budget, which shall be reviewed and approved in advance by the city budget office. So um, we are, in my view, um, in a position as, a, as city council to uh, really take seriously those provisions of the police accountability ordinance. And I think it's time for us to uh, create a separate fund for um, these agencies to be able to be um, adequately legally represented. So since the submission of this form A, we've determined that the most appropriate way to execute this vision is to allocate these funds directly to each accountability agency for them to utilize only when necessary. So I will be submitting a form B, which will propose allocating uh, approximately $166,000 in proviso restricted funds to each of the three accountability agencies for them to retain outside independent legal counsel as needed. If they end up not utilizing a portion um, or all of those funds in any given year, then the remaining balance would return to the finance general fund. Okay. Very good. Um, next item, add two positions. That's also me. Okay, so um, this uh, is with regard to the Regional Domestic Violence Firearms Enforcement Unit. It would add $230,000. The Regional DV Firearms Enforcement Unit is a multi-jurisdictional unit which includes positions in the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, the Seattle City Attorney's Office, the Seattle Police Department, and the King County Sheriff's Office. In addition to the attorneys and law enforcement officers, the unit contains city and county funded trauma informed advocates that work directly with community members and are critical to the unit's success. The mission of the unit is to reduce gun violence and increase victim and community safety through regional collaboration and proactive enforcement of firearm laws, including the newly created or relatively newly created extreme risk protection orders, which was a uh, law which was approved by Washington state voters um, through a citizens initiative in 2016. And I actually wanted to just quickly hand out a a copy of an article that we actually recently all saw um, in the paper that talked about the impact of the work 
of this particular unit in collaboration across the region um, and, and really shows the unit's value. So this is the, the article that was published uh, by Chris Ingalls on October 17th, 2019, um, where our police department, our city attorney's office, and through our um, ERPO uh, unit was able to seize a significant amount of guns from an avowed neo-Nazi in Snohomish County. So this is the kind of work that this particular unit does uh, day in, day out diligently, and, and they need additional resources to be able to continue to um, provide this kind of public safety service throughout our region. We know when we're dealing with gun violence and firearms and how firearms move through our community, oftentimes a lot of the firearms um, that make their way to Seattle are actually coming from other parts of the county or beyond the county. So a regional model and a regional effort to implement the extreme risk protection order law is absolutely critical to the success of that citizens initiative. So I've been developing this proposal for $230,000 in conjunction with the Alliance for Gun Responsibility and it has evolved a little bit since I submitted the Form A um, and would like to be able to um, get support to have a Form B that would um, hire in um, a sworn officer at SPD who would be dedicated to the ERPO division um, and would also um, increase capacity over at the city attorney's office by providing them with an additional FTE to do um, the advocacy position type of work. So all of that collectively together, I think, really sends a strong signal to our regional partners that mm -hmm. the city of Seattle is committed and serious about um, continuing to support the implement the successful implementation of this regional effort. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I will certainly work with you to see what we can do in that arena. Can I ask you just one question? Sure. So when we worked with Chris Anderson from the city attorney's mm -hmm. office a, a couple of years ago and got the money established, how are, th are those, is the work that the city attorney's office doing uh, coordinated, in your opinion, with the police department now in a way that is achieving the results that we were all anticipating? It's, um, it's a hard question for me to answer because I think there is some coordination. The question is, is could it be more, um, uh, could it be a higher level of priority in terms of resources at the police department? And I think what we're hearing from folks over at the Alliance for Gun Responsibility and others is that there are additional resources needed within the Seattle Police Department to allow for um, a greater degree of, of coordination in being able to complete that work. Um, I think everybody's doing the best that they can within um, the system that currently exists and we're seeing positive results, uh, which leads uh, us all to believe that, that adding these two additional um, FTEs would really go a long way to um, continuing to build on the success we're already seeing. Great, and I think as we're to, uh, in the city attorney's office, and I do wanna support you, in this good effort that you're bringing forward. Um, I would like to just signal to the city attorney, I'd like to hear from him and his team about how this is working because when we got this started a couple of years ago and um, our former colleague Tim Burgess was then the budget chair, we managed to get it started on a with a supplemental Mm -hmm. And we got some money and we got some work coordinated with the prosecuting attorney. I know that, that they, they told me that the first week that they were working with our municipal court judges that they got 12 of the scariest looking guns I've ever seen from people that were convicted of domestic violence offenses. And the, the guns were, you know, t t taken uh, in, a, in a way that it could be returned after petitioning the court. Um, that said... Just what you're talking about with the regional effort is so important. I just want to make sure that it's coordinated. You know, it's the same drum I've been beating since we first started talking about the system change. So I'd love if you could get any more information um, and just give me a, a highlighted response. Uh, these, it sounds like these two positions are, are very much needed in the police department, but how is the city attorney working with the prosecuting attorney working with the police to make sure that the information is getting to the municipal court judges on time so decisions can be made appropriately? Great. And Thank you, Asha. Chair Bagshaw, as yeah. far as it's, I didn't mean that my answer to imply that I didn't know if they were coordinating or not. They are very highly coordinated, and when you read the article that I just passed out, it's a really good example of exactly how coordinated they are. Um, they are uh, in lockstep and 
and talking to each other um, frequently and often. And some of these gun laws actually don't go to the Seattle Municipal Court, they're King County um, cases, but nonetheless, we need the Seattle Police Department to be um, as the lead investigating law enforcement agency, we need them to have the resources available to be able to prioritize this level of work. So there's a lot of demands within the police department in terms of patrol work versus detective work versus you know un special unit <laughs> work, um, and and we have just uh, you know in conversation with um, Renee Hopkins from the Alliance for Gun Responsibility believe that. Um, this additional resource, and they've been advocating for an additional dedicated person at SPD to um, do this kind of work uh, for quite some time now. Um, but but I think there's there's a belief that having somebody who can be dedicated at SPD will actually help to um, solidify the level of coordination that is needed. So I didn't mean to imply that there wasn't any coordination. I, I was meaning to um, uh, make clear that the additional resources will actually improve upon and make that coordination even even more solid and stronger, so that we can continue to see the regional um, outcomes that that I've highlighted with that article I circulated. Thank you, thank you for that. Okay, do you want to? Um, this is the next one is Councilmember Pacheco. Why don't you just frame this one up, Asha? Sure. It is um, a budget action to add $114,000 to support the addition of one FTE for a domestic violence technology expert. Okay. Councilmember Pacheco. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, domestic violence has been a, a personal priority for me. Um, I, I just know firsthand the, uh, the fear and the anxieties uh, that domestic violence can cause and, and um, on a personal level, you know, I, I used to wonder as a kid, uh, wanting to help my mom. Uh, so this has been a, a, a much of a personal priority for me. Um, and I want to appreciate, uh, ex extend my appreciation to Councilmember Gonzalez for uh, co-hosting a luncheon, a lunch and learn uh, with me and um, some of the agencies and partners that do the work to help uh, so many victims uh, who quite frankly, are, are, are in need of so much help. Um, as well as, I think we want to recognize just the, the, the good work that was done in, in the proposed budget, uh, getting uh, one million for the domestic violence hotline, which will help us be a leader in this effort. That said, I also want to appreciate, extend my appreciation to uh, New Beginnings, the Coalition Against Gender-Based Violence, SPD's Victim Support Team, Seattle's CEO's DV, DV uh, unit, um, and one thing that we had heard through those lunch and learn discussions as well as private meetings was that there uh, has been a prevalence of technology-based abuse such as cyber stalking and harassment. A 2019 study prompted by the technology-enabled coercive control working group in Seattle highlighted how the accessibility of technology makes it a weapon of choice for abusers. Their ability to use that technology outpaces current laws and expertise, making it difficult to use digital evidence to positively identify and address offenders. Adding an additional position to the CAO DV unit focused on providing technical assistance and training on addressing technology-based abuse and harassment will increase the number of cases the unit can take on. The new position would also provide safety planning assistance to victims. In addition to financial support, hoping this request will open the door to continued improvements suggested by the 2019 report and TECC work group, which, such as supporting a clinic uh, that provides victims with one-on-one -on -one support to detangle the technology from an abuser. Uh, I want to thank again the community-based organizations, the city department for bringing this issue forward and for the continued work and support for victims of domestic violence. Thank you. Any other comments on that one? I just wanted to um, uh, signal support for this particular uh, ad. There is um, a really interesting innovative effort that was undertaken by the Mayor's Office of Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault that um, would be complemented by this body of work. So um, I think it's I think it's sort of building on some of the the work that is be, it was really like incredibly innovative work that is being done in this space around how DV is evolving with, uh, unfortunately evolving in a way where technology is being weaponized um, to continue the process of um, subjecting people to domestic violence. So before technology, it was more of a, you know, sort of tradi traditional structure of DV and people are really starting to, again, weaponize things like social media, Netflix accounts, um, you name it, anything that is 
uh, commingled in terms of, of a platform that is rooted on the internet to, to really um, continue the abusive process oh. of, um, of folks who are trying to get out of a, um, a violent relationship, whether it's intimate or not. And so, I th so I've, I've learned a lot through my role on the, um, on the Domestic Violence Prevention Council that has really um, opened my eyes to how um, abusers can, can really capitalize on technology to continue to abuse people. Everything from horrific stories of putting bugs in people's cell phones um, to be able to track them, for example. And we have a long way to go as a legal system and as policymakers to catch up with the realities of how abusers uh, weaponize these um, technological devices, whether they're cloud-based or hardware, um, in a way that is makes it really, really difficult from for victims to become survivors and transition um, away from a violent uh, relationship. So, you know, when you have a situation where you have a mom who might be fleeing with her small children from um, a really violent situation, but dad or the partner always knows exactly where, where she, she is, is. Um, and where the kids are, that's really scary. And and when you, as the person who's being targeted, can't quite figure out why this person always knows where you're at, it, you know, it'll start making you feel like you're going crazy. So. We've heard a lot of really powerful stories in the in the Domestic Violence Prevention Council about how it's um, how we're really behind in this area and how it's really important for us to um, take seriously the need to uh, support interventions that will that will help victims um, okay. transform into survivors. Nice. In well, space. thank you both for working on that. I think this is a, an important thing to bring forward. Can I just ask one more question and then we'll move on to the next section? So last week, and I know Councilmember Gonzalez, you were there, and Councilmember Pacheco, um, and, and Councilmember Herbold, we all were able to hear from Minneapolis and the work that they're doing in a project that's similar to LEAD. They call it something different. But one thing that I came away with there was that they had a single point of an attorney in their city attorney's office that were following or at least tasked with the responsibility to follow the clients that were in their program for whether it was, I'm just going to call it lead because it was similar. Um, but they were also able to identify if there were mental health issues and to get them the programs that they need, that if it was a repeat offender to figure out what program that could serve them best. Uh, but what I also, it was the, with um, the diversion programs, you know, just across and the spectrum. And then also looking at if it's a domestic violence situation, that probably isn't right for a, the kind of diversion that we're talking about, that there's something very serious in that, in that particular case. I also came away hearing that they were coordinating their drug addiction services so that the individuals that were part of the program got the help they needed, that they actually got the service and if they needed a roof over their head that that was provided for them and that their version of drug court had treatment resources that were available to them, a little bit like what we heard yesterday from Judge Shadid. So really my question is um, to the four of us who were there, is there something that we should be including in this year's budget in the city attorney's office that builds on what the city attorney is already doing? Um, I would just like your your thoughts on this. We do have a we do have a lead prosecuting attorney in the city right. Heather was office. here. Yeah. But is it enough? You know, as we're well, talking, it's never enough. Yeah, I think but, there's. Yeah. Um, I have a note on uh, my materials here, but. Uh, um, and I can't quite decipher the note entirely, but I think there is, and maybe Asha, you can help us clarify, in the city attorney's budget that is proposed for 2020, um, I see that there's a lot of additions of new assistant city attorneys, including new um, assistant city prosecutors. Are, are any one of those positions um, in the criminal division dedicated to lead in order to assist with the backlog? I don't believe that they are, okay. but I'm happy to circle back. Okay, sure. that that could be one, um, you know, really important addition is to, uh, as we're looking at, for example, the three assistant city attorneys to civil division to decrease reliance on outside counsel. Maybe there's I, an opportunity for us to consider um, uh, taking one of those, um, if if it's not too burdensome to uh, assign them to the criminal division to specifically work on lead, for example. No, right. That's good for thought. Right. That was. That was sort of the fly I was trying to cast into the, the pond to see if there was anybody that was already swimming in this area. So um, 
I would have... I think I've just dipped my toe in it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm not a strong swimmer. I can't swim at all, actually. But, um, but this <laughs> is... I think this is pretty important for us to, to consider, and um, especially when we've been seeing the public outcry about wanting us to do more. Of course, there's always do more with less, but how about if we do more with more that is effective? And so when the city attorney is asking for a number of positions, and what we believe is that LEAD is going to assist us, but it has to be a coordinated effort, then I would just like to know more about this. Um, Asha, if you're taking the, taking the lead on lead on this element, I appreciate it. I will circle okay, back. Okay, thanks so much, all of you, for um, your, your thinking and for the participation in, in the uh, Minneapolis effort last week. Okay, if no other questions? No, if there's nothing else, we can move into Seattle IT. Okay, great. All right. Um, so the Seattle Information Technology Department uh, manages all of the city's IT resources. Uh, it also maintains and supports the services that back those resources. Uh, in 2016, Seattle IT, uh, or at that time it was the Department of Information Technology, consolidated staff throughout the city um, to form Seattle IT. And earlier this year, with the appointment of a new chief, chief technology officer, uh, Seattle IT did a reorganization. And so it's been a couple months into that, um, and they've, moved, they've changed their division structure slightly from seven divisions to 11 divisions. Uh, at the moment, um, there are no identified issues associated with that reorganization, given that they're only about four months in. Um, there aren't any specific budget issues that come up as related to that. The 2020 proposed budget adds about $14.2 million and almost 26 new positions to Seattle IT. Um, it includes um, positions to support the new Acela permitting program that we're, um, that Seattle IT is supporting enterprise-wide. It also includes about $6 million for department-specific projects, so the Department of Transportation, uh, Construction and Inspection, um, Education and Early Learning, Finance and Administrative Services, and the Department of Human Resources, as well as the SPD. Um, all of those departments have projects that are very um, specifically being supported by Seattle IT. Um, it also includes about $4.2 million in the annual wage increase um, that we discussed earlier. Uh, major changes in the programs and services that are supported by the Cable Television Franchise Fund um, are clear in this budget. Um, there's about $1.1 million worth of positions or programming that were previously supported by Cable Franchise Funds uh, that have been transferred into um, Seattle IT to be supported by other sorts of funds. There have been uh, positions and programming eliminated um, at an amount of about $646,000. And in terms of the, the, the issue that we're gonna talk about is the declining revenue in uh, the cable franchise fund. And the, um, there's an associated backfill of general fund of about $750,000 to be able to continue to support the programs uh, that the franchise fund currently does support. Can I ask a quick question on that? Mm -hmm. uh, at, thank you for this short two-page two memo on this, on this section. This is really helpful um, in recognizing that cable, cable services are being cut, that people are um, finding that streaming works oftentimes faster and better and mm -hmm. gives them people more choices. But you say at the bottom of page eight that the city will need to determine at what level, if at all, it will continue to fund these services and what source of funds it will use as franchise fee revenues decrease. Um, have, have we gotten any thoughts from Ben about what we're going to do to close that gap? Is it general fund money exclusively, or is there some other source that can be tapped? So as of right now, they are trying to fill the gaps for 2020 itself. Um, Seattle IT is developing a plan about what to do about the fact that these revenues are declining and will continue to decline over the next several years. Um, and so they're putting together a plan for what it's gonna look like if these services are gonna continue to be provided, if they're gonna have to cut them, if there are other sources of revenues that could be um, added to support the existing level of programming. Um, right now, for this, for this proposed budget, it is the $750,000 of general fund that is closing that gap. Um, that in conjunction with the transfer of the 
programs and services, as well as the cuts, um, make the fund just about solvent at this point. Um, the other piece of that is that there is now an interfund loan that's been approved um, for the cable franchise fund to borrow about $660,000 from the IT fund, and that is um, the way in which this fund is being kept solvent. And so. Um, I anticipate that they'll have a plan uh, for what it's going to look like in, over the next couple years, but at um, the, the specific issue, I think, for, for this council is whether this $750,000 is the um, appropriate amount to support the existing level of funds or if that if council decides to um, increase or decrease that, what the associated level of service will be um, for the things that are supported by cable franchise funds. Great. Thank you. Okay, any questions on that? All right, please continue. Okay. Um, so at the, um, I was going to get into issue ID, but we appear to have but we been just discussing done that. it already. Yeah. Um, so at the top of page nine, you'll see there are several options um, for what to do at this point. Um, we, the council could restore some or all of the eliminated or reduced programs and um, positions using non-cable franchise fee revenue. Um, again, not sure that if that would be general fund or um, what other source of revenue there is. I just note um, that because the city is prohibited by federal and state law from imposing any sorts of fees on internet service providers, um, there's no real way to transfer the, um, the revenue that was coming in from the franchise fee setup in the same way to streaming services. And so that, that creates another uh, obstacle to being able to find revenue to support the programming. Option B would be to further eliminate or reduce programming that's currently supported by the $750,000 of general fund. Uh, the council would likely have to identify which pieces of programming and positions um, that would want to cut for that $750,000 to be used otherwise. And then C is to change the amount of the interfund loan um, to continue to, to provide services. At the moment, the Debt Management Policy Advisory Committee has approved the loan um, only to be paid back until the end of 2020. And so um, if there were gonna be a change in what that amount was, uh, it would require approval by DIMPAC. The last option, action, um, action excuse me, option D uh, would be to take no action and to move forward with the uh, proposed budget as, um, as outlined by Seattle IT. Great, thank you. Any comments? All right. The last associated piece to this is just that there's budget legislation um, that authorizes the interfund loan. So it authorizes uh, the loan for um, an amount up to $2 million to be paid back by the end of 2020. And so the options there are um, either pass that council bill or do not pass it. Okay, very good. Any reason not to pass it? Um, if it if the council wants to change the amount of the interfund loan and then get that approved by DIMPAC, that would mean um, an amended bill. Um, but otherwise, this is the bill that would allow the cable fund to stay solvent. Okay. Thank you. Um, and there are no proposed budget actions from council members on Seattle IT. So, Thank you. so Lisa, you're up on the next oh, one. I'm sorry. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't identify an issue here, but it's more of a, um, a question, Asha. The, Seattle IT has uh, a pretty significant role to play in terms of ongoing implementation of the surveillance technology ordinance. Um, and I'm not sure if there were any issues that you identified or um, perhaps could focus on a little bit over the next um, couple of weeks through this budget process to see if we've got the resources that we need within the Seattle Information um, Technology Department to be able to um, keep up with the overwhelming amount of volume and work associated with um, with their role within the surveillance technology. So I don't know if you have um, thoughts now or if you uh, would need an opportunity to look a little bit more closely at that question. Uh, yeah, I would love to be able to follow up with Seattle IT and dig into that a little bit and get back Great. to you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, if no other questions, then let's move on, Lisa, to um, City Auditor. Thank you, Chair Bagshaw. I'm Lisa Cake, Central Staff. I'll be covering the proposed budgets for the Office of the City Auditor, the City Budget Office, and the Legislative Department. Um, then Lish Whitson from Council Staff will present the Department of Neighborhoods, Finance and Administrative Services, and the Office of Planning and Community Development. My write-up for the Office of the City Auditor's budget is on page 10 of your memo. 
I'll review the difference between the 2020 endorsed budget and the proposed 2020 budget, and then introduce one council member identified issue. As you can see on the slide before you, the proposed total budget for the auditor's office is about $2.5 million. It's very close to what was in the endorsed budget, just about 4% or $100,000 less. The proposed budget maintains the same number of FTEs. I didn't identify any issues with this budget. There is uh, one council member identified issue. Um, Chair Bagshaw has submitted a Form A proposing a 5% salary increase for the director and the auditors in the office. All but one of the auditors are funded through the general fund. Funding for the increase for the utilities auditor in the office would come from City Light and Seattle Public Utilities. Great, thank you. This um, request for a 5% salary increase um, comes from our auditor and David Jones has done a significant amount of work for us. Uh, we've had major actions that he has been reviewing and he's been with us since 2009 and I understand he hasn't had a salary increase since that time. So uh, he requested that I support a, a request for an additional 5% salary and that's what this is. Please go ahead. I'm just looking for uh, confirmation that that's the case, that there has not been a salary increase for um, the city auditor since 2000. Not a general salary increase, no. Not not above the annual, annual wage increases. Okay, so there were the annual wage they had, increases. They had COLA, right? And, uh, and what percentage was that? The, the, it, I think it, it varies I think it, from year It's to varied year. by year. I can get back to you if you, if you like. That would be helpful. The Thanks. base salary hasn't changed. Correct. So can I ask one more question? Yeah, so absolutely. With, with this proposal, Councilmember Bagshaw, how much would that take the city auditor's um, base salary to? Where base would it go, salary it right go now, from what to what? Base salary right now is 160000 169 so an eight, a 5 percent increase is roughly $8,000 more. Good. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Let's... Okay, uh, moving on to the next um, item that I'm presenting would be the budget for the city budget office. This office is on page 12 of your memo. Um, there are no staff identified issues with this budget, so I'll review the budget chart and then introduce the council member identified issue. The mayor's proposed 2020 budget for the city budget office would increase the budget to about $7.3 million, which is about an 8% increase over the 2020 endorsed budget. This increase is due to the annual wage increase in the tentative agreement between the city and coalition of unions, state paid family medical leave, and internal services costs. The proposed 2020 budget does maintain the same number of FTEs as the 2019 adopted and 2020 endorsed budgets. Council member Mosqueda submitted a form A requesting a statement of legislative intent for the city budget office in partnership with the Department of Neighborhoods and the Office of Civil Rights to develop a proposal to provide compensation for volunteers on the city's boards and commissions whose employers don't pay them for such service to make these engagement opportunities more inclusive and accessible. Very good. And I've got some notes from Council Member Mosqueda uh, asking that CBO work with our Department of Neighborhoods, as you mentioned, Office of Civil Rights, to develop a proposal. And the concept here is that there are people who would like to be serving on boards, but just find that uncompensated time makes it impossible for them to participate. So this is not a money ask at this point, but it is a sly that will ask for a review to see if there's some grants or some stipends that might be available. Because we do have 70 boards and commissions and we want to reach out to people and be as inclusive as possible. Moving on to uh, my final item um, is the budget for the legislative department. My write-up for this office is on page 13 of your memo. The budget comparison between the endorsed 2020 and the proposed 2020 budget, sorry about that, show that for the legislative department totals um, would be about $17.5 million general fund, which is an increase of about 8% over the endorsed 2020 budget, reflecting costs such as the annual wage increase in the tentative agreement between the city and the coalition, state pam paid family medical leave, and internal services costs. The proposed 2020 budget maintains the same number of FTEs as in the 2020 endorsed budget. Staff have not identified any issues with this budget. 
There is one council member identified issue relating to mayor and council member salaries. Um, council member Sawant's proposal would reduce the salaries of the mayor and city council members to 100% of the area median family income for a one person family, which would be about $76,000. The new salary would take in effect in 2020 for seven of the now nine council members. Um, the salaries are staggered um, depending on uh, your election, your term. And in 2020, for the remaining two council members and the mayor, the change would provide about $430,000 in general fund in 2020 for other council priorities, such as services for renters facing eviction. Thank you. Any comments? Let's move on, please. Okay, I will turn this over now to Lish Schwitzen from Central Staff. Good morning. Um, the next item is Department of Neighborhoods, which is on page 14 of your memo. Uh, the Department of Neighborhoods runs community grant programs, supports outreach and engagement across the city, and manages programs to support community building, like historic preservation and the Pea Patch program. The mayor's proposed budget uh, for the Department of Neighborhoods would be increased by almost $7 million over the endorsed 2020 budget. Key changes include $5.5 million of sweetened beverage tax revenue, $3 million of which would go to pea patches to preserve and enhance existing pea patches, and $2.5 million for a new healthy food fund, a community grant program. Uh, staff would be added to support that uh, healthy food fund. There's $65,000 in the mayor's proposed budget for the AIDS Memor Memorial Pathway which council members uh, helped to fund in the second quarter supplemental. So this is additional funding. Uh, and then there is an addition of five staff and um, over $7,500 or $750,000 um, to support outreach and engagement, mostly related to uh, SDOT projects, Seattle Department of Transportation. Okay. Um, there are three council member proposed budget ads, all proposed by council member Herbold. Herbold. Council member Herbold, yeah. would you like to lead all three of us, all, all, all of us through all three of them? Sure. I'll follow Lish though, if that's okay. okay. Uh, the first is to add funding to continue, um, is to add $75,000 to continue funding for a South Park safety coordinator. Fantastic, thank you. So um, this was the top priority recommendation in the 2017 South Park Public Safety Task Force report. Um, the P South Park Public T Safety Task Force was um, an effort that um, uh, came uh, after um, a tragic death in, of, of a young person in South Park. Um, it was an effort that was supported by this council, um, and we supported many of the recommendations of the task force, uh, both as it relates to um, traditional public safety interventions, um, like funding the public safety coordinator, but also um, in a number of capital projects related to lighting and transportation safety. Um, this uh, individual um, uh, is a bilingual public safety coordinator. They have continued to meet and help coordinate the work um, uh, necessary to the community um, in South Park. And I just want to uh, share with folks a, um, some materials uh, associated with that work. This is um, uh, this document. Um, is the 2018 report that lists numerous community partners that the South Park Public Safety Coordinator works with in letters in support of this position from each the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and Concord Elementary um, inter or Concord International Elementary School. Good. So do you want to go on to the and just as far as highlights for work that was done last year, um, the coordinator was involved in seven uh, crime prevention through environmental design assessments and coordinated 15 community cleanups and um, also coordinated several safety partnerships and neighborhood coordination meetings, um, as well as community safety and outreach events. Nice. Um, if I just want, I want to add just one quick comment, um, and thank you for the yellow pages that you are passing out here. I really respect the work that you've been doing in South Park, Councilmember Herbold, 
especially that just um, being deeply engaged and helping them increase the number of partners that they've been working with. I think in the 10 years that Councilmember O'Brien and I have been here, that we've seen a real uptick in engagement in South Park. And thanks for your work on it. Yeah, and I really believe um, that people feel that it's making a difference. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to thank my colleagues for supporting my efforts there. And Great. Theirs. Good. Next right. item. We will go next to a new Westwood and South Delridge Youth Safety Program. Which letter did I give you? Councilmember Herbold, you're back on. South Park Partnership. That's from the... Okay, got it. Um, so this project um, would actually um, add a yet-to-be-determined funding amount for community-driven improvements in the Westwood and South Dowridge neighborhoods, um, following a model um, that has been very successful in Rainier Beach called um, Rainier Beach, a beautiful, safe place for youth. Um, this model is one that was actually designed um, by um, the city auditor's office in collaboration with the Rainier Beach Action Coalition, Seattle Police Department, uh, and the Seattle Neighborhood Group. And um, this, this model in Rainier Beach has been funded through a federal grant received by George Mason University Center for Evidence-Based Policing. Um, it is another sort of um, SEPTED approach to addressing uh, public safety issues. Um, it ties in with a proposal that we've all seen from the Human Services Coalition budget priority letter where they recommend uh, funding for youth development services and they encourage investment for specifically ages uh, 50, five to 18. Um, the uh, community safety RFP released in uh, 2019 focused on young adults 18 to 24. Um, and so what's really important about this approach is um, it recognizes that much like Rainier Beach, there are issues associated with having a middle school and a high school on the same campus. Um, and it's, we worked with the police department to Id identify what the, uh, what the public safety risks are um, associated um, with uh, at-risk youth as well as the community. Um, and the idea behind this funding is to design a program similar to what they have in uh, Rainier Beach um, as an intervention to um, ensure that um, at-risk youth, youth are not getting caught up in our uh, schools to prisons pipeline and into the criminal justice system coming up with SEPTED-oriented uh, interventions. Okay, next item. Uh, going on, we have funding for Seattle Repertory Theater's Public Works Seattle program. Councilmember Herbold. Thank you. Um, so this funding would fill, uh, it would be one-time funding. It would fill the gap caused by the decrease in the award amount available from the Community Partnerships Program in the Neighborhood Matching Fund. Before this year, organizations were eligible to receive $100,000 from the Neighborhood Matching Fund. Before 2019, the cap on, um, starting in uh, 2019, the cap on awards changed to 25000 the amount of funding to support the public works program is still under consideration. Uh, Department of Neighborhoods changed ap application criteria earlier this year for the neighborhood matching fund uh, in order to eliminate the $100,000 award level because many projects weren't able to meet that threshold. This is one program that was able to, similarly to um, the AIDS Memorial Pathway program that we uh, looked at using the uh, supplemental budget process to address um, the same problem created by the changing in funding, but only for that for that particular project. Um, I had suggested um, during the supplemental budget process that we also um, uh, address the Seattle Reps um, uh, shortfall created through this change in the neighborhood matching fund, uh, but we agreed that we would um, only work on the AIDS Memorial Pathways funding request and hold this for the budget process. So here I am bringing it forward again. Um, and so just a little bit about Seattle Reps Public Works. Um, it was launched in 20. 
16. Uh, it's modeled after uh, New York City's public theater. It works deeply with community-based organizations to invite people from all walks of life to take theater classes, um, not just theater classes, but set building classes, um, attend performance and events, and enjoy uh, join in the creation of uh, works of participatory theater. 85% um, of participants are low income, 48% are people of color, 39% are young people, and 32% are seniors. Um, again, these, uh, these efforts are not just about bringing people to, um, to watch theater, it's about having them participate in the creation of theater through all stages of the creation um, of, um, of a piece of artwork. Um, for the public, so it's it is a really transformational experience for the folks who who participate in it, and I hope that we can uh, find some funding to make it possible for it to continue. So uh, you may have said this, and I apologize if I missed it, but the reps received twenty five thousand dollars through the na neighborhood matching grants, right. but because we went from a hundred thousand dollars to twenty five thousand, right. the people could apply, but every quarter and and we've heard from some that says right. that's not enough for us to plan it's exact same situation that we helped with the aids memorial pathway right. they were exactly in the same same situation we used the supplemental budget process to address their issue i i propose that we also help uh, the rep out during the supplemental but um we thought it would be better to bring it back okay. during the budget process very good thank you for that okay any other questions on this all right We'll right, move on to the Department of Finance and Administrative Services, which okay, is and, on. And Lisha, I just want to, uh, for those, th um, thank you, council colleagues, for being here. We're now on item eight on page 16, and we have uh, 20, uh, through 20 to go. And we're going to, I hope, hang in here until we get through all 20. All right. FAS um, provides support for the city's uh, vehicular fleets, uh, facilities, business regulation and oversight, financial services, city customer services, and runs the Seattle Animal Shelter. The mayor's proposed budget is increased by almost $17 million. Key changes include $2.2 million for the Green Fleet Action Plan to buy new um, alternative fuel vehicles, $2.2 million for waterfront lid payments, for city facilities, $881,000 to support the Waterfront Local Improvement District Administration, $365,000 for the RV remediation program, $605,000 to implement the heating oil tax, $683,000 in four, city, four positions for citywide accounting, permit integration, and human capital management IT programs. Uh, $5 million are added to the Judgment and Claims Fund, and $179,000 in a position are added for I-1000 implementation. On the capital side, there is additional funding for um, the Fire Station 31. Uh, there was an announcement just last week, and um, I've heard from CBO that that amount will need to be uh, increase to uh, implement the plan that was proposed um, by $800,000 in 2020 for a temporary facility. And they're estimating the total cost for the fire station replacement will be approximately $43,000 based on previous fire station projects. Uh, the capital program also includes space in the Seattle Municipal Tower for the Office of Labor Standards and expansion of the City Police Commission. Um, there is a reduction in FAS's budget uh, due to a delay in the Seattle Municipal Tower elevator rehabilitation uh, project, and funding is transferred to uh, Seattle Center and Parks for energy efficiency projects. There are two pieces of uh, legislation related to uh, FAS that you'll see. Uh, they both align the city's business and occupation tax regulations with changes to state law. We have three council member proposed budget ads. Uh, the first is uh, to create a parent infant room. Um, council member Bagshaw. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, th I think we talked about this in the last couple of weeks and I was alerted that the executive and the budget office were not keen on pursuing the childcare 
behind the coffee cart, and that was something that Councilmember Mosqueda and I had advanced last year, and I think others supported it, and we asked to, to get um, a, a real review on whether or not we could put childcare in the in City Hall. And it came back with a high price tag, and also what I've I heard from the executives that they would rather put that money into other child care services around the city to enhance what may already be there or to help low income areas. So with that, we know that there are families, um, moms and dads that would like to be able to bring their infants to work. And whereas I support that entirely, we know that that infants get a little fussy sometimes, and we suggested that having a room dedicated in City Hall and a room dedicated in SMT and wherever we have um, have families and we have workers, that we have space for them. And it doesn't have to be expensive, it doesn't have to be particularly fancy, but a place where parents could go uh, if the infant is um, getting a little bit fussy. Um, and it can be a room for breastfeeding, for pumping, for um, having even uh, places where people can work. Um, my vision of this is some you know, reasonable, comfy couches. I'll donate the one that's in my office when I leave. And um, just making it a, a kindly place and a quiet place for the child to calm down. So I think that even though I'm going to want to pursue the child care facility, I also can see the writing on the wall this year. And I would like to be able to say, we want a place. In, this, in our own legislative branch, we're going to have a few babies, and having places for them to go, I think, would be um, a, a wonderful option. And I'm going to ask for my colleague's support on this. Any questions? No. Nope. Okay. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next item was hinted at. Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda has a proposal to create a child care facility in City Hall. Great. Well. I will speak to this uh, in general, uh, um, and I've already mentioned it, that we last year uh, urged an opportunity to look at what it would cost to do this in City Hall. And I want to say thanks to people in DEAL. Um, they did that analysis for us. We also went and looked at what uh, the county has done right next door to us in the Chinook building, where they have a fabulous daycare that is operated by the Northwest Center. And that center, um, includes, and I, I believe it's 20%, children with special needs. And they are incorporated into the, each of the child care rooms. And it's pretty impressive how well all the kids are merging, learning, and supporting each other. That would be our vision, to be able to do something like that. Uh, Northwest Center is interested in working with us to have a child care center here in City Hall. Um, and that said, uh, we're hearing that it's you know, $4 million to build out behind the coffee cart. Um, I don't have any way to dispute that, but it certainly is a large amount of money. I think we should uh, carry this forward. Uh, we can bring it up. Having four classrooms with a minimum of, 50, of 58 children, um, operational costs are significant. We know that. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that we ought to be the leaders in this, that child care should be available in every employer's building so that it's available for families. So that's what Council Member uh, Mosqueda has brought forward. The idea is a four point, I think she's asking for $4.36 million for this. And uh, anybody else have any comments? I welcome them. Long overdue. Okay. Pardon the pun. What's that? <laughs> Pardon the pun. Long, Long overdue. overdue. Get it? Oh, Get it? Good. Okay. Thank you. We're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep moving. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next item, uh, Councilmember Herbold has a proposal to reduce the threshold for the priority higher contracting program uh, from five million dollars to projects uh, with a two and a half million dollar cost. Great, Councilmember Herbold. So, um, as folks know, priority hire promotes access to construction careers for women, people of color, and others with social and economic disadvantages. Um, by using city funded and public private partnership projects, the priority hire program prioritizes the hiring of residents that live in economically distressed areas, particularly in Seattle and King County. 
Um, the current program applies to public works construction projects of five million or more. Reducing the threshold to 2.5 million would uh, result in roughly doubling the number of projects per year. Uh, three new FTEs would administer the expanded program, providing technical assistance, monitoring, and reporting on implementation of the priority hire program. Um, so uh, this um, est the FAS estimates that six to 12 new projects a year would be added if the threshold were reduced to 2.5 million. Um, there are currently 10 projects per year. And um, we know that from the 2018 priority hire report that workers in economically distressed zip codes earned an additional 10 million more in wages than before priority hire. Apprenticeships of color nearly doubled their share of apprenticeship hours on uh, CWA projects compared to non-CWA projects, and uh, 416 pre-apprenticeship graduates and individuals receiving career navigation services were placed into the construction industry through Seattle Investments. Um, so again, as it relates specifically to not just getting people jobs, but getting people career wa ra wage jobs um, is really important. This program is phenomenal in doing that work, and by uh, lowering the threshold to include more city public works projects, we can help more people. Great. Thank you very much. Any comments? Councilmember Herbold, thank you for bringing this forward. I think it's the appropriate time to do it, and it's uh, building on a really successful program. So thanks for bringing it forward. Good. OK. Great. So let's move on to uh, Office of Planning and Community Development. Good. We're up. And that is on page 19 of your memo, um, OPCD leads citywide and neighborhood planning efforts and runs the Equitable Development Initiative. Uh, the budget is increased by $18.5 million um, in the mayor's proposed budget. Uh, most of that is a $15 million one-time revolving loan fund for Equitable Development Initiative property acquisition uh, funded through the Mercer Mega Block Sale. Uh, $500,000 in a position would support the revolving loan fund and a strategic acquisition fund that is uh, currently placed in Finance General. Um, in 2023, the city will need to update its comprehensive plan, and there are two ads related to that major body of work, uh, $500,000 for an environmental impact statement and $150,000 for outreach and engagement. Finally, there's a $134,000 ad for Sound Transit 3 planning uh, transfer from Seattle Department of Transportation. There's also legislation, uh, there's legislation uh, to extend the equitable development interfund loan for one year pending the sale of the public safety building block across the street. Uh, we're getting close to seeing uh, <laughs> permits issued for that development, and once those are issued, then uh, we can close that transaction. Um, you are grinning, and I appreciate this. I don't know how long, <laughs> I don't know how long that pit has been there, but I have told people before when I was in the prosecuting attorney's office over there in that corner of the building. So I've been looking at 90 degrees about that that pit for at least 15 years now, and. Um, it used to have just mallard ducks swimming down there. And I, when I, before I was here, I asked Fred Podesta, could we just make it a tiny home village until you're ready to build? And of course, they told me no. Um, but we're, the, we're so close, and there's actually a real sign on the wall, I noticed, that hadn't been graffitied yet. And what do we think the timeline is, Lish? When, uh, do, you th when do you think I'm going to see? <laughs> <laughs> Best case when, when, be, am I, when am I going to see a building coming up? Best case <laughs> for permit issuance would be December, but probably first quarter next year, uh, they will be able to pull their permits. Good. Councilmember O'Brien. I'm considering putting legislation forward that would require the Councilmember Bagshaw not leave until the permits are issued. So that, <laughs> <laughs> so that may That'll be, be in another turn, three. guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for all of this. Let's keep moving. That right. was a bad suggestion, Councilmember O'Brien, <laughs> but thank you. Uh, there are three Councilmember proposals related to uh, Office of Planning and Community Development. The first uh, is from Councilmember Mosqueda, and this would be a proviso on the outreach and engagement funds way. for the conference of plan um, update until uh, Council can be briefed on uh, the plan for those funds. 
Councilmember O'Brien, are you speaking to this for Councilmember Mosqueda? I would love to speak to it. Thank you. Um, and so I have some notes from Councilmember Mosqueda. This is something that I support, and I will do my best to channel Councilmember Mosqueda, but um, she and her team can fill in any blanks that I missed. But the intent, so uh, we're all aware that the comprehensive plan is a, um, goes through a major update. Um, I think it's every eight years, is that right? Yeah. And so we're, we're beginning that cycle. Um, we've obviously seen a lot of growth under the, um, in the city in the last uh, decade. Um, and there's a desire, I think, from a lot of us to uh, be very intentional about what that growth looks like going forward. Um, last year, in last year's budget, we, the council had a slide that um, requested that they do, the departments do um, use a racial equity toolkit in some of the pre-planning work. Um, we've had a preliminary response to that, but the final response isn't due for about a month and a half, I believe. Um, but this would go further and ask that they um, and provide us some funds um, to ensure that in OPCD's outreach process, as they plan for the new comprehensive plan, that they're doing the full racial equity toolkit, including the outreach program to communities most impacted. Um, I want to just highlight a couple of the points that Councilmember Mosqueda's team has made to me. Um, doing a racial equity toolkit around the urban urban villages um, is intended to not be a business as usual. Um, recognizing that the growth that's happened uh, throughout our city has, by definition, not been equitable. It's been um, very concentrated in our urban villages because that's our strategy, which means that 75% of the land um, of the residential land has received almost no growth. And it's really important that as we do this comprehensive plan that we bring back, that they bring back and answer questions directly related to where the growth needs to happen and um, tie that closely to the displacement we've seen in our cities uh, and make sure we're incorporating people who've been Im most impacted by that displacement um, into the proposals that we're looking at. Um, it's, it's anticipated that they return recommendations to create more housing access in 75% of the city that's currently out of reach for all but the highest earners, while simultaneously addressing historic inequities and present day displacement pressures caused by, discri by discriminatory public policy. Um, so colleagues, this is something that I um, am excited to see the city doing next year and I'm thrilled to support and hope can have your support for it. Great, thank you. Um, Next item is the EDI funding for Central Area Community Development. Yes, and that's from uh, Council Member Sawan. Um, it provides funding for a group to work with black churches in the central area in uh, developing parking lots and uh, mixed use projects. Okay, any comments? A quick comment, um, I'm, I'm sensitive to um, certainly encouraging that group um, I want to be careful that we do have an EDI funding process that's very community driven um, and I've been very uh, impressed with it. Um, there are way more projects that come through that process than there is currently funding for, um, but having the community collaborate and work together and identifying the priorities for community and figuring out how to sequence them I think is very valuable to the city. And I want to just be cautious that we don't inadvertently short circuit a process that I believe has been working very well. And so um, to the extent that, that this is a project that went through that process and didn't score highly and is unlikely to score highly for certain reasons, um, I'm open to looking at questions there, but I, I want to be careful that we don't change this process to one where the council's all of a sudden picking the projects we want to be funding through EDI and rather support the community process. Um, and to the extent that there are really good projects that aren't getting funding, I'd rather focus our efforts on increasing the funding for it so more projects can qualify. Great, thank you for that. Um, and the next item is uh, council, from Council President Harrell that he wants to support a community-driven innovative development project and if you would like to give us a few sentences on this list and maybe yeah. Councilmember O'Brien can speak to it as well. Uh, the funding would be for a um, consultant, a real estate consultant to help uh, community driven projects, Weedle and Deedle. Um, and uh, it'd be a group with uh, deep experience in the central areas African American community. I don't have anything to add. Okay. To that, but. All right. Thank you. 
Anybody else have anything to add to it? All right. Thank you. Let's move on to page 22. All right. And this is Amy Gore. Thank Welcome you. to the table, Amy. Thank you. Councilmember Bagshaw, as you mentioned, this is on page 22 of the memo, and we'll be talking about the Office of Hearing Examiner. Um, the Office of Hearing Examiner is an independent office of the city responsible for conducting fair and impartial administrative hearings as authorized by the Seattle Municipal Code. The office holds hearings and decides appeals in cases where citizens disagree with the decision made by a city of Seattle agency. I should say citizens or residents. Um, the Office of Hearing Examiner's um, 2020 proposed budget is just over $1 million. Um, this represents an increase of about $73,000, which includes taking one part-time FTE to a full-time FTE. Um, this is in anticipation of an increased workload to hear appeals of fire code violations following the passage of Council Bill 119650, which Council passed in September, and gives Seattle Fire Department citation authority. Um, at this time, there is one proposal um, for the office from Councilmember Pacheco. Uh, oh, just go. Sorry, I'm so used to Councilmember. Councilmember Pacheco, jump right in. <laughs> uh, this ask comes directly from the Office of the Hearing Examiner and stems from conversations I had with, the, with Hearing Examiner Vansell around implementation of the CEPA reform bill we passed two weeks ago, colleagues. Uh, here in Examiner Vansell has identified two low-cost investments that we can make to address lengthy hearing times and improve efficiencies within the office. The first is a one-time funding of just $8,000 to pay for portable hearing equipment. Uh, currently, the hearing examiner has access to two hearing rooms, only one of which can accommodate large multi-party hearings. So when a large hearing such as the MHA appeal is being heard, other hearings that could otherwise be handled quickly are sidelined for months because there's no physical room to hear them. Uh, portable uh, hearing equipment would allow the hearing examiner to handle other hearings concurrently with a large appeal. It would also give the hearing examiner the option to hold hearings in the communities that are impacted by the decision to open the process to more people. Uh, the second piece of this budget ad would be $15,000 of ongoing funding to support the participation of a city planner in mediation processes for hearing examiner appeals. Currently, mediation is seen as too costly of an option for many appellants because they must bear the cost of a, plan a planner participating themselves. This funding would enable more appeals to avoid lengthy hearings by making mediation a more affordable, accessible option. And finally, I just wanted to, uh, I've shared a copy of the letter that hearing examiner Vansel sent to all of us on October 8th requesting these budget ads. Thank you, Councilmember Pacheco. Anyone else have any comments on that? Um, I'll just add that um, I really appreciate your work on this, Councilmember Pacheco, and appreciate the engagement of um, hearing examiner Vansel. Um, we um, passed the CEPA reform, um, was that just a couple weeks ago? <laughs> just a couple weeks ago. And I, I know that the hearing examiner had expressed some concerns in advance of that. Um, I do believe that we have shared goals to keep his office robust and um, do things as timely as possible. And so I really appreciate his ongoing engagement in helping give us clarity on what the types of investments can be. Um, I particularly appreciate that he's identified some low cost investments that hopefully um, can, can ease up some pain points so that we will see a recognition of what we um, hope to achieve with the legislation we passed two weeks ago. Next one. Sure. If there aren't any questions about that, um, next I'll move to the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, and this discussion is found on page 23 of the memo. Um, the 2020 proposed budget for this office is $3.9 million. As we discussed during the September 27th briefing, appropriations to the office decreased 22% from the 2020 endorsed budget. This is primarily due to two changes. Um, first, a change in the accounting of some grants that usually come in later in the year, which we are still expecting but don't want to put on the books until we actually receive them. Second, because King County will be doing contracting for the expanded legal defense network rather than giving those funds to the city to distribute. Um, there are three council member proposals identified at this point in the process, and the first is from Councilmember Gonzalez. 
Councilmember Gonzalez. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the first item would um, add an additional $750,000 to the budget for the Office of Immigrant and Ref Refugee Affairs. As we know, the Trump administration's ongoing threats and uh, policy and rule changes that impact immigrants from refugees is, um, is becoming intense and increasing every single day. Some of that administration's actions are forcing families to choose, literally choose to go hungry or forego health care and other public services that keep their families housed and healthy um, and all because of their uh, reasonable fear of deportation and becoming uh, entangled in the uh, immigration, uh, for-profit immigration jail system. Our community expects to know uh, sometime next year on how the U.S. Supreme Court will weigh in on issues like DACA or TPS, uh, but the proposed rule changes around public charge are already having a negative impact in immigrant communities and ultimately, unfortunately, achieving Trump's goal of scaring families into the shadows. So even though there was a positive uh, result on the public charge rule for now, um, the effect of fear and, um, and, um, and intimidation is unfortunately a bell that can no longer be unrung as it relates to uh, actions by this administration. So our partner community-based organizations have said there is a growing need for a rapid response fund in light of these ongoing attacks from the federal administration. Uh, this would be similar to the one that was created in 2017 to respond to emerging threats through specialized legal clinics and deeper community education around things like policy changes related to the public charge rule to not further, to hopefully be able to mitigate the disruption on the lives of immigrants and refugees in our community. So this, these uh, $750,000, I imagine, would be subject to the ordinary request for proposal um, process and would be um, uh, flushed into, uh, into community to be able to meet the ongoing and immediate needs of the immigrant and refugee community in the face of these federal administrative rule changes that all of us, I think, um, appreciated the depth and the complexity of those issues when we had um, OIRA's uh, Director Kuvu at the table uh, walking us through the presentation of, um, of the work that they do every day. Really. Uh, Councilmember Pacheco? I just want to express my support and uh, for both one and two, but I'll give my reasons why on number three. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. Shall we go on to the next item? Mm -hmm. And the second item is to add one FTE, um, and that is also from Councilmember Gonzalez. So this would, thank you, this would be complementary to uh, what I just described. So again, we heard from OIRA that they are um, continuing to address and deal with the uh, vast amount and volume of policy changes uh, that seem to be coming out of the Trump administration every day, um, all intended to um, attack and um, and create a hostile environment for immigrants and refugees uh, in our city, frankly, whether they're here um, uh, with documentation or without. Um, matters little to this administration. They just really want to create an environment that's hostile to discourage immigrants and refugees from fully integrating into our communities. And this is an opportunity for us to provide OIRA uh, a, a single full-time um, employee equivalent to be able to really just focus in on those federal policy changes that um, are having a devastating impact on the, Im the local immigrant and refugee community and really be able to support some of the work that the community-based organizations would be doing in the Resilience Fund should that be funded. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, next item is, and I think this is Councilmember Pacheco, you were going to dive in. Sure. Um, so this summer, or, the, or when I first was appointed, I opened up a district office uh, at the University Heights Center. And over the summer, uh, as I was having district office hours, I would hear from constituents um, as they were seeing the images uh, over the summer about uh, what was happening in our southern border and what was happening, what the he who shall not be named administration mm -hmm. was doing at the southern border. Um, and a number of constituents it wanted the city to do more. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm very strongly supportive of, of one and two. Um, like the two amendments that Councilmember Gonzalez has offered. Uh, additionally, um, 
when I worked at the Office of Minority Affairs uh, at the University of Washington, I would hear from uh, other staff members the anxieties that so many undocumented students uh, would have about both the renewal or immigration status and so forth. Um, so, I, I, you know, my office had inquired to OIRA uh, what we were doing. And um, in 2018, the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs was able to use $20,000 in one-time funding to work with nonprofit 21 Progress to provide grants to help DACA recipients afford the $495 DACA renewal application fee. With a Supreme Court decision on DACA's fate looming and with the possibility that the program could sunset at some future date, I believe that we should provide OIRA with another round of one-time funding to help DREAMers renew their status before the program ends. I plan to put forward a Form B to add $50,000 in one-time funds to support this work and have been discussing this with OIRA and 21 Progress. I am also aware that there may be interest from private donors in matching whatever funding the city puts forward for DACA renewals. Uh, on a personal level, um, growing up as a, uh, growing up, my two older sisters uh, were undocumented, and my mother used to always say to us, you know, no matter what, that we always had to protect Elaine Mariella. And so I am pursuit of this, uh, not just because of my experiences at the Office of Minority Affairs, not just because of what I heard from, uh, from constituents, but because I, I think this is what we should be doing as a city and when we ask ourselves uh, in news reports, what can we do? Um, this I think is something that uh, is a small step, but I, I would be a big change and big difference maker for so many of those young people, not just in my district, but through our, the 7,300 people that, that are undocumented and dreamers across our Seattle metropolitan area. Great, thank you for that. Okay, any other comments on these three items? All right, thank you, Amy, Great. very much. Next is Craneable. Good, Hi. thank Craneable, you for coming. Central Staff, and I will begin with discussion of the Seattle Department of Human Resources. This is the department that's responsible for recruiting, hiring, and supporting the city's workforce, as well as administering compensation and benefits program. The 2020 proposed budget is for 323 million, and that is comprised of 25 million for the operations budget and 298 million for the personnel compensation trust fund. For the operation budget, there is an addition of $6 million from the 2020 endorsed budget. Some notable additions that comprise that $6 million include a comprehensive wage study at for $2 million. For this project, the Seattle Department of Human Resources would conduct a comprehensive wage study of city represented job titles with current market rates uh, consistent with the terms of a memorandum, memorandum of agreement between the city and the coalition of city unions. The study would evaluate approximately 650 titles citywide with an estimated completion date of December 31st. Another notable addition is approximately 336,000 for a scoping study on replacing the HRIS EV5 application. And that is the system that the city uses for employee timekeeping, payroll, basic HR management functions. We have, it has been reported that that system has reached the end of its useful life. And so SDHR is scoping out a replacement 2020, they are proposing the 336,000 and estimating that there would be a expenditure of approximately 2.2 million for the following year's budget. Next is a proposed addition of 11.5 staff members. 7.5 of them would be ongoing, funded uh, primarily through central cost allocation, so different departments would be adding money to fund those positions, and then four employees that would be in term limited temporary positions. For budget legislation, there is a proposed council bill that would establish a new employee giving program for charitable contributions. This would this legislation would be comprised of amendments to the employee giving ordinance that has been in effect since 1988. And this proposal would eliminate the requirement to have the charitable giving program happen through payroll deductions. And it would 
there would be a designated campaign administrator to actually run the program rather than the city. Or there could be the option of it happening with this designated campaign administrator or the city. The designated campaign administrator would be a qualified nonprofit third party administrator that would lead the campaign, provide full campaign support, and also distribute the employee donations. As background for this change, SDHR states that since initial implementation in 1988, the program expanded significantly. Staffing could not keep up to meet the intensified program demands. There was an audit and an investigation several years ago that showed a strong need for more program management and more internal controls. So in the 2018 proposed budget, the uh, SDHR actually recommended abrogating one of the positions that was handling this charitable giving campaign and actually moving towards third party administration, which is one of the recommendations that came out of the audit and the investigation. So since the adopted budget did abrogate that position, since then the department has been taking steps to discontinue payroll deductions and that will actually happen on January 7th of next year. They plan to inform participating nonprofit organizations of this change this week. And then there will be a two-week charitable giving campaign that will be run by United Way of King County in November, November 8th through November 22nd. So an item for council to consider is the impact of removing payroll deductions from the employee giving campaigns. In 2018, 10% of city employees donated about 644,000 to almost 700 nonprofit organizations. An example of the size of such donations, Northwest Harvest received 34,000, so about 8,000 per quarter. And another example are 15 employees collectively donating about 5,000 to new beginnings for survivors of domestic violence. So given this history of giving that has been a consistent source of funding for these nonprofits, the council could consider amending the bill to require an enhanced charitable giving campaign during the first year of implementation, perhaps two campaigns or an extended campaign. Um, I would like to speak um, in support of moving forward with Bobby Hume's recommendation. Um, 1988, there was no such thing as donate buttons on the internet, and they, we didn't have the kind of fundraisers that we see all fall and all spring from some of our favorite charitable donations. Um, and one of my concerns about the, the payroll deduction is it took a, quite a whack out, and I believe it was like seven or eight percent, so that um, it wasn't free to the individuals that were donating the money, and then there were administrative costs by the organization that was receiving the money. So I think there were people that were feeling like you know, upward of 15 to 20% of administrative costs were taken before their money actually went to the services that to, wh to which they thought they were donating. So if we can reduce those costs, make it still simple for people, and encourage com the kind of charitable giving we've seen, I think that is terrific. But I will also note that, as you point out here, that 34,000 went to Northwest Harvest through this program. There was a lot more of city employees that gave directly to Northwest Harvest, and I want to encourage that. Any other comments? Okay, please right. continue. In the absence of comments, we'll move on to the Office of Labor Standards. Thank you. Uh, Office of Labor Standards strives to improve workers' lives through implementation of labor standards and also administering two very large outreach and education funds that comprise about a third of the budget and that also support an advisory commission and the domestic worker standards boards and they also are creating innovative uh, policies as well. The 2020 proposed budget for the Office of Labor Standards includes $6.8 million, an increase of about $207,000 from the endorsed budget. OLS is not proposing any changes to employees, staffing, or operations. Uh, these <laughs> increases are due to standard cost changes, annual wage increase in the tentative agreement between the city and coalition of unions, and contributions to the state paid family medical leave. Something to 
that the council may want to consider in relation to Office of Labor Standards is the cost of translation and interpretation that the office provides. The office truly does have a robust language access program. They translate their materials into 19 or more languages. It goes through a two-step process where it is translated by a professional services company, and then it receives a layer of review from a fluent speaker in the community to make sure that the translation is meaningful to the folks who were reading it. They have forecasted up to about 20 translation projects for the upcoming year. Their budget has a line item for about $25,000 for language access. They estimate that it'll cost almost $42,000 to complete this work. They indicate that increasing funds for language access is not necessary because they predict underspending in other accounts such as operating supplies, employee recognition, and software purchases. The council may want to consider adding resources to cover the full cost without the underspending in the other accounts. Okay. I don't see any questions. Um, I do have comments, oh, sorry. however. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see you grab the microphone. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, on, the, um, on the language access um, costs, I do think it's important for us to, and I spoke to this during the OLS um, uh, presentation, um, I do think it's important for us to take seriously the need to cover language access costs for the department. I think we heard from um, Director Garfinkel at the time that it is absolutely um, a need and that the department does uh, the best that it can with what it has. And I think that um, uh, Karina's presentation is, a, is it, during this process is a testament to that. I think it's pretty obvious that they, they are committed to language access and continue to do what they can at the highest quality possible. Um, and I would um, be supportive of adding an additional $17,000 to cover the additional uh, language access costs uh, in order to recognize uh, the need for implementation of the five new labor laws um, that we passed um, that will go into effect in 2020. Great. Thank you. Okay. There is one proposed council budget action for Office of Labor Standards. I'll reach over and get the slide so we can have our visual for that. Councilmember Mosqueda uh, proposes adding $1 million to the Community Outreach and Education Fund and the Business Outreach and Education Fund. Uh, this would be an, an ongoing addition for the Office of Labor Standards to partner with community and business organizations to conduct and facilitate outreach, education, technical assistance to low-wage workers and small businesses on Seattle's labor standards. As background, in 2015, the council created the Community Outreach and Education Fund as a two-year contract cycle for $1 million. In 2016, the council created the Business Outreach and Education Fund for $475,000 as a one-year contract cycle. In 2017, these funds were perceived as ongoing. The Community Outreach and Education Fund was increased to 1.5 million per year, and the Business Outreach Fund to 800,000 per year. Since then, the funding has not changed. In the intervening time, Seattle has passed five additional labor standards. The state has passed additional worker protection laws. Census data shows stark racial disparities in Seattle median household income. So this budget action would add additional money to increase outreach on uh, ways to empower workers and empower businesses to put these laws into place. Okay. Councilmember Herbold. Thank you. Um, so by my quick math, it looks like it's about uh, 2.3 million in outreach and education that the Office of Labor Standards has. Correct. Okay. I just want to flag um, again the fact that the um, uh, Seattle's Office of Civil Rights has no dedicated funding for outreach and education. Their investigators are the ones who are charged with doing outreach and education to um, uh, the community when, um, when implementing new laws. And I feel that it's a very um, inequitable situation that um, we do not have any dedicated funding for outreach and education for the um, Seattle Office of Civil Rights when um, that office is fulfilling a similar function um, as to the Office of Labor Standards um, in enforcing 
um, regulations that the city has passed that have profound impacts to um, people uh, related to, um, to race and our social justice values of the city. Um, so I am continually bringing this up to signal, signal my desire to uh, figure out a way to um, have both um, some parity between those two offices, both as it relates to the numbers of investigators and the investments that we put into outreach and education. I think it, um, the, the, the folks that it benefits um, in doing so are, are the folks that with um, the passage of the laws that we've passed on this council over the last several years um, will reap uh, benefits um, for the constituencies that we hope to represent. Great. Thank you for that. Councilmember Gonzalez. Oh, thank you. So I have um, notes from Councilmember Mosqueda's office on this particular budget request, which is hers. Um, before I read those, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the point that Councilmember Herbold continues to make uh, as it relates to issues related to um, uh, community outreach um, for uh, the Office for Civil Rights. I, I certainly um, agree that there needs to be some attention placed in that category as well to make sure that we are um, uh, providing the resources necessary to the Office for Civil Rights to enforce our civil rights laws um, and would be interested in hearing more about um, about sort of the breadth of that work and the scope of uh, the needs in terms of additional outreach, of course, in the Office of Labor Standards um, uh, category, we have uh, been very deliberate about uh, requiring uh, evaluations of most of these labor laws that have really focused on um, two things. One is uh, how deep is the knowledge amongst the workers that are impacted by the laws or protected by the laws? And, and similarly, what is the knowledge amongst the employer base about those laws that has really sort of laid the framework and the foundation for identifying identifying dedicated revenue streams to be able to do, uh, to support some of these outreach um, funds and, and um, perhaps that's, that's a good place for us to start in terms of being able to um, identify what the scope of the needs are. But that being said, uh, before us is this request to add $1 million to the Community Outreach and Education Fund and Business Outreach and Engagement Fund um, to the Office of Labor Standards uh, budget. I think Karina did a good job of going over some of the talking points that I have in front of me from Councilmember Mosqueda's office. Really just wanted to emphasize that uh, since its creation in eight, on uh, April 1st of 2015, uh, we have acknowledged and uh, moved OLS forward with the understanding that its mission is to advance labor standards through thoughtful community and business engagement, strategic enforcement, and innovative policy development with a commitment to race and social justice. OLS implements many of the labor standards that the City Council has passed, paid sick and safely, fair chance employment, minimum wage, wage theft, hotel employees, health and safety, secure scheduling, and the domestic workers uh, ordinance as well. Um, OLS has had great success in terms of enforcement of these uh, laws and in uh, achieving recovery for uh, workers, including um, uh, some examples here, October 15th of 2019, there was a $182,000 settlement with two Hyatt hotels for alleged violations of the minimum wage and wage theft ordinances that impacted 234 employees. September 16th, 2019, there was a $172,000 settlement with Jack in the Box franchise for alleged violations of the secure scheduling ordinance impacting 569 employees. On August 15, 2019, there was a $686,000 settlement with Arizona Staffing Company with an Arizona Staffing Company for alleged violations of the minimum wage law that impacted 358 employees. Uh, and that's just sort of the most recent examples of this, I think, all this year of some of the work that, that has been done by OLS on the enforcement side. In terms of community-based outreach and enforcement, um, we know that our community-based nonprofit organizations play a really critical and important role in the co-enforcement model that is used by OLS to create a culture of compliance. 
with Seattle's minimum labor standards among employers throughout the city. Uh, low wage workers are most likely to be victims of workplace violations like wage theft, including people of color, immigrants and refugees, LGBTQ communities and other marginalized workers are also the least likely to come forward with a complaint to the Office of Labor Standards. Um, so I think it's Im important for us to make sure that we acknowledge that this work is centered on those efforts as it relates to all of our labor standards um, and um, and that the need for additional funding is is uh, present and really important. We've added one labor standard, um, the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights, and passed four hotel worker bills since the last substantial increase to this particular uh, fund. And uh, I think it's really important for us to, um, to uh, increase the fund to make sure that we um, are being able to engage in the extensive outreach needed to, um, to the additional workers that will be covered by the variety of these new um, labor, labor standards. So um, we also know that OLS is intending to shift its enforcement priorities to directed investigations. So this will, will inherently put our community-based organizations and business organizations in a position to um, need additional um, outreach to be able to understand what the rights and responsibilities are, um, even in the context of directed investigations. That is it. Any further comments? Yes, please, Councilmember Herbert. Um, just in response to um, Councilmember Gonzalez's point earlier, um, uh, Asha uh, from Central Staff did a really good analysis in last year's budget discussions um, around the, um, the shortfalls, both on the investigation side as well as the outreach and education side uh, for the Office of Rights. I'll be sure to send that on to folks for their review. Also, um, as it relates specifically to Councilmember Gonzalez's point about the knowledge that people have about our civil rights laws, um, one of the points that has come out of a recent um, uh, race, race and equity toolkit analysis that this council last year asked the Office of Civil Rights to do. Um, one of the um, one of the results of that um, RET was a recognition be, through work that was done in the community with focus group works and um, town halls um, is that um, the knowledge of our civil rights laws is insufficient in the city um, and lot of pe a lot of people don't even know that there is a Seattle Office for Civil Rights and so that really creates a chicken or egg situation. If you don't know that the office exists um, and you don't know that the that the office exists to, um, to um, enforce the laws related to civil rights, um, it also has an impact on um, the public sentiment around um, enhancing funding for those services. Yeah. So we have, we have a really um, robust um, engagement um, with the stakeholders with, uh, associated with Office of Labor Standards, partially because we've done so much work um, funding um, um, outreach and education about our labor standards laws. Um, and so that has resulted in um, the very good recommendation to increase funding for outreach and education. We don't have, we haven't, we haven't developed a constituency like that for the Seattle Office for Civil Rights. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any further comments on those? Please continue. All right, Yolanda Ho, Council Central Staff. And at this point, we have seven more presentations, so getting close. <laughs> so we will be talking about the Office of Sustainability and Environment, and uh, which uh, works to provide citywide coordination of environmental initiatives, conducts research and develops programs and policies focusing on environmental equity, building energy, food policy, and transportation electrification, and also coordinates implementation of the Seattle Climate Action Plan. I'll be going over some differences between the proposed 2020 and endorsed 2020 budgets, and then we will discuss council member proposals. Thank you. Thank so um, the total proposed 2020 appropriations for uh, the Office of Sustainability Environment, also known as OSE, is 11.6 million. Um, the difference is about 3.8 million between the proposed and endorsed, which is a close to a 50% increase to OSE's total budget. The 27% uh, drop in general fund support you see at the table represents action uh, by the council earlier this year to establish the Sweet and Beverage Tax Fund. So those, um, uh, revenues can be tracked separately from general fund. 
Uh, so the 3.9 million of sweetened beverage tax revenues in the endorsed 2020 budget were shifted from general fund to the sweetened beverage tax fund and also the proposed budget um, would add 2 million to expand the number of fresh bucks vouchers that the office can offer to residents who are in the food security gap, which are, so those are residents who um, ha experience food insecurity but do not necessarily qualify for some food assistance programs. And so the proposed would be, proposal would be to increase from 2,000 vouchers to 6,000 vouchers because there was great demand earlier this year when um, people were signing up. And these vouchers fund purchases of eligible fruits and vegetables at participating retailers. The general fund increase uh, shows uh, increase for salary and other benefit increases, including the annual wage increase uh, and ongoing funding for the climate director position, which was added in last year's budget. It also includes uh, $595,000 from the heating oil tax, which the council passed in September. Um, to Councilmember uh, Pacheco's question last Wednesday regarding the heating oil tax revenues, um, based on the impacts of council amendments to delay implementation from the 1st of July to September of 2020 and exempting the biodiesel portion of the heating oil, um, this is estimated to decrease the, reven the 2020 revenues by about $27,000. So the total revenues would be about $568,000. And I will note that um, because of the delayed implementation, there, there may be some efforts by uh, customers to kind of wheedle their way out of uh, paying the tax so they, you know, so they might purchase their oil earlier. And um, so we're not really sure what the revenues will look like next year, but it, it's, in, it's possible that they may be lower. Um, and so also the proposed 2020 budget would add two new positions to support the municipal energy efficiency pro a municipal energy efficiency project uh, for a total of three staff. These two new staff are a resource conservation advisor funded by the real estate excise tax one and an administ administrative assistant who would be funded by utility rebates earned through conservation efforts. And these two ads reflect priorities in the mayor's climate action strategy which um, they included a near-term action to double the existing budget in uh, 2021 to 2025 for energy efficiency in municipal buildings in order to achieve a 40% decrease in uh, carbon emissions reductions by 2025. So um, on to budget actions proposed by council members. Brian. Um, first by council member Brian to add staff support and uh, funding to support the Green New Deal Oversight Board. Great, thank you. Council Member O'Brien. Colleagues, we've uh, discussed this a few times, but just quickly, um, when we passed the Green New Deal res uh, resolution and then again the ordinance establishing the Green New Deal Oversight Board, it has always been anticipated that there would need to be a staff person um, to both oversee the Oversight Board and also work with the interpartmental team that is set up. Um, in addition, we established that the positions of the Green New Deal Oversight Board would be eligible for stipends if, um, if the participants um, wanted to access stipends, and so this would also include funding for stipends for the year. Okay. Thank you. Any thoughts? <coughs> Please, let's go to the $35,000 for natural capital valuation analysis. Councilmember Herbold. Thank you. Um, so I'll have another um, letter to distribute. Yeah. I have so many. Let's just put them out there. Um, <laughs> I get so many more than I need. Um, but I guess they're for the public. So um, this um, request derives from a previous year's uh, statement of legislative uh, intent response from, uh, from FAS from a previous bu budget cycle. The um, letter I've circulated is a letter of support signed by a number of local organizations um, ranging from uh, Seattle Audubon to PCC to REI. Um, and um, like I said, a number of other organizations, uh, Dowridge Neighborhoods Development Association. Um, the letter notes that treating our green infrastructure as an asset aligns with the city's many environmental intentions and commitments, including carbon reduction and increasing 
tree canopy. Um, and the idea is that um, uh, through discussing with central staff, um, this could entail one of two approaches, either having um, the organization um, that does the natural capital evaluation work with outside citywide, which is a program in um, the Office of Planning and Community Development that seeks to leverage city-owned open space across departments for open space purposes. Their focus is primarily on outdoor activity, but there's also a recognition on the environmental benefits of open space in preparing for resilient future. The other option is having them work with the Office of Planning and Community Development's comprehensive plan team to build in these concepts um, after, after getting the, the open, uh, I'm sorry, the natural capital ev uh, valuation, getting a sense of what the value is of our, our natural infrastructure. They could then work in the concepts of ecosystem services into the scoping of the environmental impact uh, study for the next big update to the comprehensive plan. Um, this idea exists in the comp plan, but it could be better enunciated and more deeply in comp, uh, incorporated into the comp plan um, if we had a valuation like this that would begin to capture um, what the value is of our of our natural assets. Um, an approach like this was used previously um, by Seattle Public Utilities um, when many, many years ago, um, uh, an organization called Earth Economics did a um, natural capital valuation for the Cedar River watershed um, as part of the decision making um, around um, around uh, uh, the city um, moving towards um, taking that um, that very important asset to um, that we've received reaped many benefits from since that decision decision making at the time. So um, I think this approach has a good track record, um, both nationally, but also um, here in the city of Seattle. I think they also did a natural capital study um, uh, for Discovery Park as well. Thank you. Right. Council Member O'Brien. Thank you. Um, uh, Council Member Herbold, I appreciate you bringing this forward. Um, and I'd be interested to see if there's an opportunity to um, uh, either combine or align efforts with something I intend to do. Yesterday we had a great uh, presentation at council briefing from folks with the Green Seattle Partnership. And um, that work is related to this, and I'm not quite sure yeah. if there's an overlap, but um, I'm considering putting forward a slide to ask the Parks Department to come back to council early next year on how they're planning to um, meet the original timeline of, of restoring all the parks acreage and, um, and open space acreage by the year 2025, which was their original commitment, um, and what kind of funding would be needed in the upcoming um, municipal parks uh, um, adjustment that might happen in, in next year's budget. But obviously those lands, when they're restored to their full health, provide significant uh, value, and so. So about a, uh, um, a consultant study that would do the valuation of these lands could potentially help provide a very good argument for why it is that we need to speed yeah. up the work of the uh, Green uh, Partnership. Yeah, that's yeah. great, okay. And I'd like to just underscore that Portland's been doing this for a number of years, it's always Portland. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to, I'd like to know more about what we can do to move this as, I mean, on both of your ideas and consolidate and see if we can um, bring bring that interface together. Very good. Thank you. All right. That's it, Yolanda. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we will move on to uh, page 32 of 42, and this is the Office of Inspector General for Public Safety. And Greg, back at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Greg Doss, Council Central Staff, here to talk to you about the Inspector General for Public Safety. As the Chair mentioned, it's page 32 of your packet. Um, the Inspector General for Public Safety was established in 2017 via Ordinance 125315, which is the Accountability Ordinance. This ordinance um, provided that the OIG would uh, provide oversight of management practices and policies for the Seattle Police Department and the Office of Police Accountability. They would monitor ongoing fidelity to organizational reforms implemented pursuant to the goals of the 2012 Federal Consent Decree and audit and review criminal justice system policies and practices 
related to policing and um, other criminal justice matters. Um, as you can see in the uh, materials before you, there is a $2.5 million appropriation in the 2020 proposed. The main difference between the 2020 proposed and the 2020 endorsed is that one senior auditor was added and one auditor, regular auditor, was added. Uh, the senior auditor is going to ensure that there is compliance with auditing standards and the auditor would expand the capacity of the office to perform its duties. The uh, council member proposal is to add one unfunded FTE to serve as the OIG office manager. Right now, the department has indicated that uh, its office management um, functions, human resources, public disclosure, budget and finance are split between an executive assistant and the deputy director, and that um, those two functions uh, have to concentrate in other areas, and that this would allow them to to go back to um, being a deputy director and executive assistant and have dedicated um, support functions. Um, it is uh, an, a strange agency in the sense that it is part of the legislative branch. Um, it, although it does not receive budget and finance or human resource support from the uh, legislative staff. So there is a, a need here for them to uh, staff these functions themselves. And with that, I would turn it over to Councilmember Gonzalez to talk any more about the proposal. Thank you. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, I think Greg did a very good job of um, laying out the need and the particulars here. This would be, the only thing I would say would be a effectively, um, at least for the 2020 budget cycle, a revenue neutral addition to the budget. So th the Office of Inspector General has indicated that they have enough uh, dollars in their existing budget to cover the salary of this new position in 2020 due to salary savings. So this is a fantastic news for the budget chair situation. This is requiring <laughs> no more new money. So we do not have to do, what, what was the word we were using yesterday, Cal calisthenics, um, to identify additional dollars for this. This would just be providing um, the Office of Inspector General position authority to be able to hire an uh, office manager to fulfill the functions that were laid out by uh, Mr. Doss. It will put us in a situation as um, a city council in the future to identify ongoing funding in the biennium budget, um, but that is a problem for uh, future Lorena and future city council members. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other comments on that? I do love things that don't require additional funding. All right, please go on. All right, now we're going to talk about the Seattle Fire Department. Unfortunately, there the proposal will cost some money, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, the Seattle Fire Department but a, provides... But a worthy cause, a worthy cause. Uh, always a worthy cause. Uh, the Seattle Fire Department provides fire protection and prevention, technical rescue, and emergency medical services for the city of Seattle. Um, there is $223 million uh, proposed to be appropriated in the mayor's uh, 2020 budget. And largely the difference between the endorsed and the proposed is a series of technical changes that have to do with wages and central service rates. The, mo the main policy change that the, the department has is uh, an addition of 400000 to enhance the health one. Uh, truck, which of course is the mobile integrated health services with two firefighters and one social worker. The uh, proposal before you is to add 1.17 million to the Seattle Fire Department to fund an additional firefighter recruit class. Um, SFD personnel have indicated that there are a number of firefighter position vacancies that could be filled if there was an extra recruit class uh, created. Um, they have indicated that they have uh, quite a few vacancies now that are being created by an aging workforce that uh, folks are separating from the department. And of course, because they are uh, a mandatory staffing minimum hours department, Anytime they have vacancies, they have to fill that with overtime. And so uh, adding additional staff would allow them to, um, to, to staff at their minimums and, and not use overtime. And uh, this ad, this 1.17 million, is about half of what the class would cost. I have been working, trying to wheedle the information out of CBO on um, what the uh, scalability of the ad might be so that this ad might cover part of a class and we'll have more information on that for the council very soon, I hope. 
Great. Thank you for that presentation. And I just want to give a big thumbs up and thanks to everybody for our Health One effort that grew on work we did last year. And Chief Scoggins has been fabulous, along with John Ehrenfeld, that we have moved as far as we have in this one year. Councilmember Herbold, do you want to talk about this class? It sounds like a great idea. I, I really would. Um, you know, the. Um, this is an issue I think that is um, at just as important as our efforts around um, increasing police staffing. Um, we've pledged to um, increase the size of the police department by 200 officers, um, but we're having uh, challenges. We're, we're making progress, but we're having challenges with staffing. Seattle Fire Department does not have that problem. They do not have the same challenges with recruitment and retention that, um, that the Seattle Police Department is having. And given that, um, and, and, and given in particular that there was an underspend uh, in the police department's budget associated with um, the inability to uh, fully fund the positions or fully hire for the positions that the council has funded, I think it's important that um, that we see whether or not we can use some of those funds associated with the underspend um, at the um, police department to address this other, what I feel is a, an impending public safety crisis. 25% of um, the Seattle Fire Department is 53 years of age and eligible for retire, retirement. Um, and 38% of the department at 50 years of age is eligible for retirement. Um, when I asked whether or not um, the department could use a third class, um, the chief here at the table uh, during the fire department's budget presentation said he'd be absolutely be able to take the new re new recruits. Um, Again, um, they uh, have full recruit classes. Um, Every time that they that they have a, a new class, um, we know that 215 firefighters need to be on duty every day, um, and right now, um, a lot of them, um, a lot of those spaces are being filled with overtime. Um, so I guess that's that's the. Um, uh, extent of my my points, as as Greg said, um, we are looking to see whether or not the classes are scalable, um, and whether or not thirty recruits per class is a hard cap. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to support you in it. I really appreciate the work the Seattle Fire Department has done and their openness to try these new things. So if we can support them too, let's go. All right. Anything else? Up it looks next like is we're my up to colleague, Seattle Eric. City Light. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Good, good morning. Uh, I'm Eric McConaughey. I'm the Council Central staff. <clears throat> and I'll take a few minutes to uh, talk through uh, Seattle City Light's budget. Uh, by just a quick overview, Seattle City Light is uh, the city's municipal power utility. It serves more than 460,000 customers in Seattle and parts of seven neighboring jurisdictions and uh, parts of un unincorporated King <laughs> County. Uh, Seattle City Light sells uh, retail power to those uh, customers in the residential, business, and industrial uh, sectors, and also uh, power on the wholesale market. Um, and then uh, those revenues are deposited in the Light Fund. So when you look at page 34 of the Central Staff Memorandum at the top, that table is constituted all, um, entirely of dollars in the Light Fund. There's no general fund dollars in that table. Um, and moving right along. Uh, the breakdown for the proposed uh, 2020 includes a total of about $1.4 billion uh, for the entire City Light uh, budget. Capital, it comes in at about $378 million and operating at $1.05 billion. Uh, this budget relies on uh, the rates uh, that were uh, approved uh, previously. So those, uh, that rate ordinance was set for, uh, was approved last year and it was for the 2019 and 2020 rates. It is consistent. Uh, with uh, those uh, rates that council approved in uh, 2018. The increase um, of about 0.8% compared uh, from in the proposed budget compared to the endorsed budget has mostly to do with uh, increases on the capital side for utility crews and engineers that prepare utility poles for the attachment of communication equipment. This work is fully reimbursable uh, through revenues that are gathered um, through uh, fees for those costs. Uh, consistent with that, uh, since 2017, City Light has had seven temporary positions that are approaching the three-year limit for uh, the city's policy and temporary positions. 
the proposed budget would make those positions permanent uh, for the work I just described, and would also add uh, one budget for um, data analytics and accountability. Uh, during 2019, Seattle City Light went through a reorganization. Uh, there were no changes to funding or staffing overall. Uh, however, uh, the proposed budget would incorporate some changes to that organizational structure into the budget summary levels. As you recall, those are the, the big sort of, uh, fu sort of fundamental blocks that built the budget. And uh, those changes would be renaming some of those BSLs, refocusing the pur purpose of some of those BSLs, and also uh, the, propo the proposal would include a new BSL, uh, Leadership and Administration Facilities and Oversight. Great. Uh, finally, uh, the, along with this budget comes uh, a 2020 Seattle City Light Bonds Ordinance. This was transmitted to Council uh, to authorize the issuance and sale of municipal light and power bonds. Passing this legislation would allow a City Light bond sale of up to $250 million that is anticipated to occur in October 2020. And uh, the proposed budget relies on the passage of this bonds bill. Uh, the options would be to pass the bill, amend the bill, and pass as amended, or do not pass uh, that bonds bill. Thank you. Um, I have nothing more to add here other than thanks for this good work. Uh, I also want to say thanks to Deborah Smith, who is heading up our Seattle City Light. Uh, she's um, an, an impressive new director. And she did something, I thought it, it was marvelous. Any time a director will help me get to yes, it makes me happy. And you know, we're working on the Thomas Street uh, connection from Westlake to Seattle Center and then uh, west of Seattle Center uh, to across the John Coney Bridge to the park. And she was so helpful around the Broad Street substation. They were doing some work there they had do, they had done a plan to do some art, but as soon as she heard about the pedestrian bicycle corridor priority, she agreed to help us lighten it up, brighten it up, expand the, the sidewalk, and I just really appreciated the fact that she was willing to do that. She had art, the 1% for art money available to her, so this is not an additional money ask, but she just jumped right on top of it, and I really appreciate it. Thanks for your help. Okay, Eric, any other questions for Seattle City Light? Seeing none, let's move on to Seattle Parks and Recreation. I think, Council Member Juarez, you have the only budget action, but we'll go ahead and let um, Tracy lead, in, lead us into the background. So we are on number 18, yay. Yeah. Council Member is Tracy Ratz of Council Central <laughs> Staff. So uh, we have, you had a previous uh, presentation by the executive on the department, so I am going to go very briefly through my memo uh, and the contents of my memo. I'd be happy to give more detail. I could be wheedled into providing you more information, but um, <laughs> unless you have questions, I'm going to go pretty quickly through this um, and then can move on to council uh, recommended actions. Um, so as the table you have in front of you shows, the uh, Parks and Rec uh, Department budget did increase by $13 million overall, or a 5.3% increase compared to the 2020 endorsed. Um, there is, um, uh, again, in my memo, you see kind of the major drivers on both the operating side and the capital side in terms of those changes. Um, again, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about those. I think the department um, presentation went through those pretty well. I think I'm not so, seeing any questions. Um, well, I was just um, wanting to acknowledge the fact that Parks has been, again, another very responsive department this year mm -hmm. and appreciate the work that you've done, Tracy, and City Hall Park and Yesler Crescent. That was you know, something that had zero momentum a year and a half ago, and now we've moved really quite far in making it feel like a safe and inclusive space. Thank you for that, because I really appreciate your good work on it. Um, also want to acknowledge that the Metropolitan Park District, it will be going forward for the next round of what the priorities were and the community outreach. Um, I believe it's already getting started, but thank you if you've That's got correct. more information on that. And Councilor Ryan was correct. We will have a new six-year spending plan uh, for council adoption next fall, hopefully actually a little bit earlier than the fall budget time. Great. Very good. Thank you. Councilmember um, Juarez, you've got the 150,000 feasibility study. Yes, but before I go there, um, are you done, Tracy? Uh, 
I know, actually, I was going to just go quickly through the budget legislation. Okay. Um, you, yeah, because so there's two points I want to make, but I wanted Tracy to finish. Okay. So we do have um, a parks fee ordinance uh, that is in front of the council this fall. Um, it would make changes to the 22 or 2020 parks fee ordinance that we actually adopted in last year's budget. Um, this year's uh, proposal makes a couple of changes. One, some technical changes that just address some issues with the class and course registration system that is unable to uh, <coughs> process certain partial fee amounts. Um, and I won't get into the gory details, just they just needed to make some changes to the fees to let the system work properly for customers. The second is um, the legislation would eliminate the low income recreation swim fees. Um, if passed, the legislation would allow low income individuals to swim free at all city pools. Uh, this change would result in a revenue reduction of $45,000 annually. Uh, to backfill this revenue reduction, the 2020 proposed budget would reallocate $80,000 of $150,000 in funding that the council provided uh, in the 2020 endorsed budget to expand the daily operation of an unspecified number of waiting pools. Again, I think this issue was discussed by the executive during the department presentation. Um, the mayor's proposal would maintain the operation of waiting pools at 22 pools at 709 operating days at a total cost of about $70,000 and would use that remaining uh, funding of $80,000 to both eliminate the low income swim fee but also to, and also to expand the lifeguard training program, particularly focused on recruiting diverse low income youth. So your options as it relates to the legislation are to pass as transmitted or to do not pass. Great. Thank you. Any questions on that? Councilmember Pacheco. I uh, just wanted to just quickly highlight that uh, I was really happy to see that uh, there was an investment in District 4 in the mayor's bu proposed budget. Um, a lot of work has been done in the Magnuson Park community in recent years, and I know my predecessor, uh, Councilmember Johnson, had done a lot of work to, to uh, get resources for the Magnuson Park community. Um, and this is just another great improvement that I think that we make uh, as a city. Outdoors for All does amazing work, not just for District 4, but for our entire region, helping individuals with disabilities and their families enjoy activities like skiing, biking, kayaking, hiking, and more. Uh, each year, Outdoors for All serves nearly 3,000 people, and this one-time investment will allow them to renovate Building 18 for office space to continue providing these services. Councilman? Okay. Okay. Chair? Yes. May I speak Councilman to Worth. Yeah, thank you, Councilman Pacheco, for taking my thunder there, buddy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, I, there's two think, comments I want to make before I actually get to the second comment on regarding um, A-Love. Um, Outdoors for All, as you know, we've been working with them since 2015 in this $1 million one-time funding to renovate the future office space is just, um, I cannot tell you what this does for the community. Outdoors for All has attended every Live and D5 event for four years in a row and have brought all of their biking gear, their staff for people to use the uh, experience, um, including myself. They are wonderful and much needed resource to help better the life of those that are physically challenged, sight impaired. Um, the vehicles or the bikes um, allow for parents and their partners and their friends that can ride with them and participate. Um, I am just really proud of working with Ed Bronson and their team and also the money that they have raised in the private sector. Um, this is just a drop in the bucket of the millions that they've raised to expand this. So I'm very proud to um, support this and I'm thanking the mayor's office for making sure that this was in there. So my second item, of course, as you know, is regarding um, Aurora Licton Springs, North Seattle, and I'll be submitting a Form B as well. Uh, Aurora or Licton Springs is a up and coming residential neighborhood located between the east and west side of Aurora and North Seattle College, which includes constituents of both districts five and six, but of course would be open to everybody in the north end or for the whole city for that matter. It spans roughly between 80th and Aurora North to Bitter Lake at 130th. We're anticipating growth and increased density in this neighborhood, particularly with the opening of light rail at Northgate and the Northgate Pedestrian Bridge. I'm really proud of this organization and this community group because when I first got elected, we start meeting with them and helped organize them well over two years ago. So for me, it was wonderful watching a community grow and we grew with them and to help organize them. Um, the Aurora Licton Springs Urban Village, A Love, uh, with members from both District 5 and 6, is promoting a plan for a more walkable community which includes safe pedestrian access to retail, a grocery store, which they don't have one, and a community gathering place. 
The feasibility study would assess the recreation and community and gathering meeting space needs of the neighborhood. That is north of 80th. It, well, all of that. This type of facility that would best serve those needs and the cost of securing such a facility. Currently, there is no senior center facility in District 5, and both Green Lake and Bitter Lake community centers are at capacity. So this feasibility study is timely considering the population growth and the density coming to this area. I want to remind my colleagues that when we were working on the budget and some other uh, matters last year, we also passed a moratorium on storage units so these neighborhoods could be better organized and um, actually talk about walkability in their neighborhoods. These neighborhoods also use the rapid, um, the um, what is that called? The bus, the rapid line. Rapid ride. Rapid line. Rapid ride. Right. Thank you very much. Um, and also, this council voted to upzone many of the neighborhoods in from 80th up to 145th. So this is a growing community where we're looking at hopefully, or uh, we are going to have affordable and low-income housing. Um, and we also um, want to emphasize that we want to replicate what we did on the other side of I-5 with the Lake City Community Center. Um, Licton Springs doesn't currently have a community gathering space, and A-Love has energized residents to work together to find a way to build a neighborhood that is more sustainable while facing challenges posed by its juxtaposition to Aurora. That is Highway 99. A-Love has identified a community gathering place as a helpful tool in building a stronger community for residents north of the Ship Canal, but more in particular, Districts 5 and 6. Now, this is more of on a personal note. So I think what we're seeing here, at least what I'm seeing here, is that we are actually being deliberate in building new and reinvigorating former communities that um, were somewhat disrupted by Aurora. And Aurora has changed a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. And so um, I'm, I'm proud that these, this, this group got together, worked with our office, because they are encouraging density and growth in their neighborhood that is still affordable. So what we're hoping is that we can replicate what we did in the Lake City Way Community Center, where we are planning to build a new community center and also building 50 units or possibly 75 of low income and affordable housing. And those are the opportunities that we want to explore for this particular neighborhood. And so I would hope that I would have my um, colleagues support on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any comments? Councilmember O'Brien. Um, Councilmember Juarez, thank you for your leadership on this. And I'm excited for um, potential opportunities uh, to make investments in that neighborhood to a um, uh, I really appreciate your framing about how Aurora has divided the community as a major uh, uh, vehicle throughput. Um, and I really appreciate the community members in that neighborhood um, working hard to figure out how to create that uh, kind of sense of space that, that, that any community needs um, despite having a, a major road going through it. Um, and I think it's a great investment. Could I do one more thing? Sure, absolutely. I think when I, I think some people think that when I talk that all I want to talk about is D5, but I don't. Um, it is, it's citywide, as you know, I chair parks and community centers. So I now have a, a front row seat about how community centers work and libraries work. And they are not our libraries and community centers of 10 or 15 years ago. We are providing enhanced services. We're providing housing. Um, um, homelessness prevention, we're signing people up for Medicaid, we're handing out food, we have social workers, we're trying to get um, our community centers to work with, um, to have showers for people who are unsheltered. And so when we, when this, when this community center, when this community group came together, and, and again, this is, what I found most striking about ALOVE is that these were community activists that were much older and and new neighborhoods and new families that were much younger. And it was interesting that before, um, through Department of Neighborhoods, they couldn't get into the community councils. So this was a group that could never get into that council to get their needs addressed. So for me, they're one of the first community groups that got past this um, to be more inclusive, uh, for people to recognize that people who live on Aurora, both sides, particularly with Bob Eagle Staff School opening up with 1,600 kids and a light rail coming, that these neighborhoods are welcoming density, but they're also young families. 
And um, we, it's still a part where um, we have upzoned those areas and that it is still affordable in Seattle and it's on a rich transportation spine. So for me, I really want to support those neighborhoods that have done the hard work. Great. So thank you. Okay. Council Member Wars, you have been a stalwart uh, for D5. And even though we tease you about that, we, we know that you are, your heart is in uh, with parks and all that good work is you're looking citywide. I appreciate that. And I also want to acknowledge and say thank you that you're including all ages and abilities in this. So uh, recently I was talking with some of the elected leaders in Shoreline and it kills me because at 145th <coughs> suddenly Shoreline is looking pretty good. Know. You know, they've got trees and they've got, you know, <laughs> overpasses and things and it's like, that. what's that? And so I no, I think this is what A Love is doing. What you are looking at is really helping us um, recognize that we can do so much better and make it a place that is pedestrian friendly, and that we're uh, including on top of potentially a new community center, um, low income units, and that's something that you have been a real champion for. Is making sure that as we're renovating or adding community centers to parks that we're putting housing up above, it's an opportunity for us to do it. And, and I thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Okay, um, that, is, that is the end of parks. So now we're, we're moving on to Seattle Public Utilities. And I think Brian, you're gonna be handling that. Tracy, thank you as always for helping us with parks. Great, thank you. Uh, Brian, good night, Council Central Staff. Uh, so just to orient you to the memo, uh, we're gonna be on page 38 of the memo right now. Seattle Public Utilities, or SPU, is one of the largest city departments and is responsible for operating three distinct utilities, the drainage and wastewater, solid waste, and water. Uh, each of the utilities has separate revenue sources and capital projects, but they do share many of the same operational and administrative functions. SPU revenue consists uh, primarily of customer charges that are known as rates, and they may only be used for utility purposes, and those get deposited into one of the utility's three enterprise funds. The 2020 proposed budget for SPU is consistent with the strategic business plan that was approved uh, for the department in 2017, and a 3.2% reduction in the proposed budget relative to the endorsed budget is largely the result of deferring capital expenditures to align with revised project schedules and also for lower debt service payments. The proposed budget would also add six FTE to provide accounting and data management support, and three FTE to replace temporary staffing at solid waste transfer stations. <laughs> And if there's no questions, I'll move on to the budget legislation for SPU. Great, and um, I think we've got, yes, please go on the, uh, with the rates, and then I just want to alert Council Member Herbold, it's gonna be the Herbold Show again in just about three minutes. Very good. Great, thank you. Uh, so there is just one piece of legislation for SPU, uh, and that would establish solid waste rates for residential and commercial customers for the period from April 1st of 2020 through March 31st of 2023. Uh, if approved, the solid waste rates would, on average, increase by 3% in 2020 and 2.9% in 2021 and 2022. Now, for a typical single-family residential customer, this equates to about a $1.50 increase uh, in 2020 and 2021 and about a $1.60 increase in 2022. Is that a monthly increase? That's a monthly increase, that's right. Uh, and these proposed rates are lower than the uh, rates that were included in the 2017 Strategic Business Plan. Uh, so in terms of options, council, of course, could approve the legislation as it was proposed or could choose to either not adopt the rates or to amend the rates. Uh, if either of the latter options were chosen, uh, we, it would require amendments to the 2020 proposed budget. Thank you. Thanks. Councilmember Herbold, would you like to just take these on or do you want Brian to frame uh, them for you? I'll follow after Brian. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Great. Please. Thanks. Uh, so the first <laughs> proposal uh, does come from Councilmember Herbold uh, and the action would add $30,000 of ongoing funding to improve the notification process for residents of multifamily buildings when the building is facing an imminent water shutoff. Thank you. So um, I've been working with Seattle Public Utilities to get their um, shutoff policies updated since last November after a constituent brought this issue to my attention. Um, specifically, this relates to um, water shut the water shutoff process um, for multifamily buildings. Um, they currently only notify um, the owners of an impending shutoff rather than the individual tenants. Um, and so the intent of this funding is to allow for Seattle Public Utilities to contact residents directly about about imminent water shutoffs. Um, recent, recent, so I, I mentioned that this 
was brought to my attention last November after a constituent brought the issue to my attention. Um, you may have seen just a couple weeks ago, this happened again, um, a 59 unit building had its water shut off and we saw firsthand how tenants bear the cost when a building owner doesn't pay their bill. Um, if a shutoff is impending, uh, SP's previous practice was um, to, uh, again, notify the property owner and then to um, tape a 30-day notice to the front and the back door, nothing more. Um, and that's just for the 30-day notice. For the um, impending shutoff notices that come after the 30-day notice, they did not have a policy of even posting the building. So SP, you will now, in addition to the 30-day notice, mail tenants directly seven days prior to the shutoff and post post um, an additional 24-hour notice on the main entrances and exits. Um, if the building is accessible and has less than 15 units, SPU will place door hangers on each unit. And then finally, um, SPU will notify the Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections, um, their tenant uh, um, resources unit, uh, 24 hours before the shutoff. Um, and it's um, important for SDCI to have that information because they can work with the tenants to um, um, to utilize self-help remedies in the Landlord-Tenant Act to avoid a shutoff um, in the instances that a, um, a property owner is refusing to pay. Then finally, Seattle Public Utilities will alter the language that they currently use to make it user-friendly and provide information to tenants about their rights to this self-help remedy I men mentioned, repair and deduct. Good. Thank you. Any questions? All right, um, utilizing water infrastructure for municipal broadband. Again, Brian, would you frame it for us? Yes, thank you. Uh, so this action would request through a statement of legislative intent that SPU explore the feasibility of utilizing the city's water pipe infrastructure for developing a municipal broadband network. And that's similar to what is being pursued in the city of Anacortes. Great, and I believe this is a statement of legislative intent that Councilmember Herbold would like Correct. Um, it builds on the work that Seattle City Light has done in the past on the on the issue of municipal broadband. Um, the um, using the um, existing water lines uh, drastically can reduce the cost of installation, and it's also less disruptive to install. Great. Thank you. And we'll go to the last item here. Every other week, garbage collection. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this action would request also through a statement of legislative intent that SPU work with the city's solid waste contractors to negotiate a provision of every other week garbage collection into the existing contracts. Is that, uh, uh, Councilmember Herbold, is that a mandatory or an optional? This is optional. This is um, a, a statement of legislative intent and it's by its nature is an expression, it's like a resolution from the council, it's an expression of our, our hopes and our intents. Um, there's no uh, budget proviso associated with this, but um, there's great promise, I think, in moving our city uh, to every other garbage week, um, every other garbage pickup. Um, the uh, current solid waste contracts took effect in 2019 and are effective till 2029. They do include a provision for conducting pilot tests of alternative collection methods or schedules. They do not specifically contain an option for a permanent change in the collection schedule. Um, I have had conversations um, with those contractors. They are open uh, to discussing this, despite the fact that it's not specifically called out in the contract. Um, and the intent in this proposal is to pursue an action that may reduce collection truck emissions consistent with the council's recent adoption um, of resolution 3189 Five, supporting a great Green New Deal for Seattle. Um, oh, and that reminds me, I have a letter to distribute from uh, 350 Seattle. Um, SPU study found that a 35% reduction in vehicle emissions associated with picking up trash um, every other week um, as opposed to every week. Um, Seattle's recycling plan calls for 70% of Seattle's solid waste by uh, 20. 22. It's likely that the Seattle greenhouse gas inventory will need to be updated to account for emissions associated with the life cycle of the consumer products we all use, and it's um, certain that we use less. Reduction in garbage pickup should be accompanied by publicity about our recycling goals and, most importantly, the climate benefits of reducing consumer waste. Um, other jurisdictions that have every other week garbage collection include Renton, Tacoma, Olympia, and Portland. I recently had um, um, the solid waste uh, 
solid waste manager from Renton come and do a presentation in my committee about Renton's program, which I believe is more than 10 years old of every other week garbage. So we are way behind um, uh, the, the vanguard in this issue. Yeah, please come to President uh, Harrell. A question, this one sort of intrigues me. Um, recycling now is already every other week. Is this garbage and compost or just garbage? This proposal is for garbage only. Um, it would not affect the current um, every other week recycling pickup. What about the, the yard waste component? That's every week now. Is this That is also every week now. Um, it, it, that is not called out um, in, in this um, as being part of that discussion, um, but perhaps it should be. Well, and because it's important to get um, the trucks that are out every week um, out yeah. only every other week. Yeah. The, the compost yard waste, I was wondering always how seasonal that is because I think it's all year every week, but I always thought there were fluctuations uh, in the seasons on yard waste pickup and whether we should have a variable schedule based on that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's just my personal use of my yard waste or everyone else's, but it seemed to me that it is should be seasonal, but, but I'm not sure, and I'm sure they would have that data. So we may want to consider them at least looking at the yard waste component <laughs> as well to see if it's variable. Uh, but I like where you're heading with this. It looks like, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, reading reading I think, the body language. But I think this discussion would be right. great to tee up some of these questions for the slide, Councilmember Herbold, because I, um, I think the original uh, theory was to go to every week yard waste and food compost, they're combined, um, with the idea to get the things that can turn smelly if they're right. kept for more than a week out of the garbage so that garbage could be um, right. A lot of the things would be eliminated. Councilmember right. Bakeshaw mentioned diapers, which is um, something that gets brought up a lot. And in the examples in other cities, um, I think Renton was at the table at the committee. You know, those those problems didn't seem to materialize with some of the technology and bags and what they heard from people. They heard a lot of concerns in advance, but end. but after they went into it, it wasn't a problem. Um, I would also be Councilman, Council President Harrell. I think. Um, um, your question about the seasonality of yard waste is a good one. It'd be interesting to explore. I was similarly putting out my, what is now a food waste bin, which is massive for the summer amounts I need to, to compost. And there's just, you know, a few things of eggshells and vegetables left over. And it's, it's kind of I'm wondering, does it even need to go out? Because there's so little in the bottom of it. Um, but it does start to smell if you leave it in there too long. So it would be interesting if there's a, if they have different strategies with different technologies or what they would propose knowing what to do. So I, I think it's, I, I really appreciate Councilmember Herbold, your persistence in looking at this because I think it's time for us to come up with um, some revised strategies on how we want to reduce our overall amount of um, waste that goes into the landfill and divert as much as possible. Great. Good. Yeah, I mean, this is really w in, with knowledge that we are, um, we're not meeting our recycling goals. Um, we're noticing uh, a plateauing, mm -hmm. and there is conversation not just in Seattle but in the state about maybe focusing our goals on waste reduction mm -hmm. um, rather than um, rather than only recycling, but overall um, reduction in personal personal consumption and um, uh, use of, of of products that lead to um, to waste, and so. Um, the, the, this approach, I think, in other jurisdictions um, has made consumers think about that more, um, knowing that um, the garbage is being picked up less frequently, and so it has actually had um, waste reduction outcomes. And so as far as, far as um, you know, what's on the table, um, I, I'm, I'm open to structuring this sly in such a way that we can consider a wide range of options with um, both waste reduction as a goal as well as um, reducing the number of trucks on the road as a goal as well. Very good. Very good. I'll, I'll add, I think, um, one of the conversations that came up at your committee was also about how we measure our targets and we were uh, our current goals I believe are largely about percentage of diversion um, and so what percentage of our waste is being diverted from the landfill what that means is that as we add a lot more cardboard and packaging for instance that can be recycled um, that looks good on our metrics because it shows a higher percentage is being diverted but of course that packaging is all uh, I mean it, it, it's better to be recycled than thrown away but 
if we didn't need to use it in the first place, that's the best thing. And when we see the amount of packaging decrease, um, that shows up in a reduction of percentage going to recycling, which shows our numbers being less. And so they had talked about converting our, um, I believe they talked about converting our goals to a tonnage target right. as opposed to percentage. And I, I think it's really great to figure out how we can make some pivots here. Good. Very good. All right, thank you. Um, I think that's it for Seattle Public Utilities. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Herbold, Councilmember O'Brien, for weighing in on that. Uh, so the next is budget legislation with Ms. Panucci. Thank you for all your leadership, and we've really appreciated your help in the last few weeks in particular. Thank you. Good morning, council members, or good afternoon, perhaps now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, wait. I'm Ali Panucci with your council central staff. And so, so, you know, hold on to your seat. I know this is the presentation you all have been waiting for to wrap up these, these conversations about budget legislation. Um, there are 29 pieces of legislation identified to date to implement the proposed budget. Each of the council bills, resolutions, and clerk files listed on pages 40 to 42 of the memo will require committee action to recommend that the legislation pass, not pass, or pass with amendments. The majority of the proposed legislation has been discussed in individual budget deliberation papers that have occurred over the last several days and um, last week and or in um, specific departments or topics that have been discussed today as part of the miscellaneous paper. So I won't go into great detail and walk through each piece of le legislation and instead will describe the broad groupings of the legislation. First, there is a um, set of approximately five or six pieces of legislation to amend, adopt, or endorse the budget. There is legislation, the second category is legislation levying the 2019 property taxes, or excuse me, 2020 property taxes. Um, the third category is legislating, legislation modifying fees and charges for city services. The fourth category would um, adopt legislation that is either proposing new or amending existing policies and regulations for taxes and use of funds. Uh, there is a fifth category of legislation authorizing issuance of bonds and a sixth category of legislation authorizing interfund loans or repealing um, interfund loans that are no longer needed. And then finally, there's sort of an other category of legislation that has a nexus to the budget or has been part of these budget discussions. Um, that, that includes some of the TNC legislation. So through review of the proposed budget, the council may identify amendments to this legislation or new legislation that may wheedle its way onto the list if it is needed to carry out the council's budget actions. Um, and so with that, I will leave it at that unless there are questions from the committee. And this would close out our discussion of issue identifications. And we'll look forward to coming back next week to begin our discussions of the specific council budget actions as we prepare for the chair's package. Great. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I know, Councilmember Gonzalez, that you'd love to go through line by line here. <laughs> um, uh, but if not... It, and we have no more questions. Allie, thank you for bringing this forward. And we will uh, conclude this part of our conversation this morning and turn to public comment. So thanks to all of you for being with us for the last two and a half hours. Um, and again, Council Central staff, thank you, Dan, your leadership. I appreciate it very much. Okay, um, we have uh, John Keegan, Leah, um, Martin Westerman, and... Those will be the first three, and then we'll move on to Joyce Modi, Mary Jean Gilman, Don, Donald, as it looks like, Cassell, and Monserrat. So John, Keegan, Leah, and Martin, if you will please come up to the microphones. Thank you. Is this, is this mic the one that's the best to you? Yeah, it's good because you can stand up straight. Okay. I'm John Keegan. I'm a trustee for Seattle Rep, and I'm going to speak to something that relates to the Rep. Uh, I should say also I'm a resident of Seattle since 1970. I've been a voter since 1970, a rate payer since 1970. And, and, and a writer, I, don't forget that. And, and right, exactly, <laughs> bike rider. But I appreciate, and also Councilman Herbold, which I understand this is your part of the, of the agenda. I appreciate all of you, the, the, the deep and careful scrutiny that I see just this morning and throughout uh, is admirable. We have a good city council and a good uh, and a good government but thank thank you we don't hear that all the put time put some time back yeah. on that clock <laughs> right. give, give that man two minutes <laughs> but, but here and I, I wish more people could see that and, and watch this but uh, anyway i'm here to talk about uh, the city's support for the reps uh, public works program uh, you generously helped us launch this new idea two years ago with a hundred thousand dollar grant that came from the department of neighborhoods and 
I want to, with this a little bit, tell you kind of what's happened and why this is important. But um, Public Works is, is a radical departure from what the Seattle Reps Theater's normal program would be. Uh, instead of building a play, we do eight plays a year with equity actors and present uh, you know, the traditional kind of stories, a very diverse set of stories, but nevertheless with the equity actors. This public works program is a departure in this way. Instead of that, we bring on 80 to 100 community uh, you know, folks, old, young, disabled, of, of, uh, uh, of any condition. And we have made partnerships over this past couple of years with these nonprofit organizations, uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs of King County, Bird Bar Place, and all of these contribute to this program and send us the people that are gonna show up on the stage and say, hey, why not uh, these people? But also the Jubilee Women's Center, Path with Art, the Ballard Northwest Senior Center, Seattle Central College, Compass Housing Alliance, and our newest partnership with Refugee Women's Alliance. So what this ask is really on behalf uh, of the rep, but as well as our partners in, in this. Um, I'm gonna but have this to ask a, you to get to the last sentence. To the last sentence? Yes, oh, please. You're at the ready to end this. Well, only that you've got two minutes. And, oh, I do, uh, okay, you're right. And the light I'm not is watching it carefully. Anyway, uh, we obviously are uh, asking you uh, for an ask, $100,000 before, I don't know what it is, but I just wanted you to know that the impact of the program is, is a change. It's a thing that the, the rep has been trying to do to create a more, you know, a more social justice, equity, a program that, that works beyond that. And so uh, to, to end this, I'm asking that you listen. Leah's also gonna speak as well, but I hope that you can return again generously and keep this program going. We make no profit from that. Tickets are free, and they go like crazy when it's announced that you have free access. And the, the diversity of the audience for these kinds of shows is amazing. And the bouquets that get brought up to all of these young kids, <laughs> older women and men, Great. to do it can help us continue Thank this program. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, and good to see you. Uh, Leah, then Martin, then Joyce Moti, and Mary Jean will get queued up. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Leah Fahori, and I am part of the Public Works team at Seattle Rep. I wanted to thank you for considering our budget request um, under the Department of Neighborhoods and for taking the time to hear me today. And thank you, Council Member Herbold, for supporting our budget. Um, I'd like to share with you some of the community and individual impacts I have seen firsthand from this program. Um, Seattle Rep's Public Works partners with community-based organizations to invite folks from all walks of life to take weekly classes, attend performances and events at Seattle Rep, and join in a, creation, a creative, ambitious work of participatory theater. Um, through this process, strangers become neighbors, and we create a city and region that is welcoming to all. We are rooted in the values of equity, imagination, and joy, and public works is theater of, by, and for the people. It is important for us to define these, define these core values as they are integral to every decision that we make. Equity is listening fully and doing our best to make sure everyone has what they need to show up. E um, Imagination, um, exercising creativity, not only in what we are making, but in how we are making it, and joy, um, enjoying each other's work and each other and plant, cultivate, and grow our collective joy. Um, we uh, are grateful to collaborate with eight local community-based organizations across five city council districts. These include, include the North Seattle Boys and Girls Club at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School, Bird Bar Place, Jubilee Women's Center, Path with Art, Ballard <coughs> Northwest Senior Center, Central, Seattle Central College, Compass Housing Alliance at Renton Veterans Center, and our newest partner, Refugee Women's Alliance. Um, our participants are thriving humans who bring their ex extensive talents to the project. It is important to know that we are not trying to gift or serve these communities with theater. We are constantly reflecting with our community organizations um, about if our relationship is still mutually beneficial. Um, and Seattle Rep also experiences great benefit from these connections and endeavors. Um, at the same time, we hear from participants about how this has affected their lives. Um, just a quote to share with you, Michael Dare, one of our participants from Path with Art said, I'm really grateful, grateful and I'm going to take with me the relationships I have built through this process. Um, and lastly, a quote from uh, Danny uh, Beth Turk, who is our uh, 
our partner at uh, Jubilee Women's Center. Public Works helps participants build confidence, communications, and interpersonal skills, and have a vital impact on their personal development. Great. Lee, As you consider you. our budget proposal, uh, please know how essential city support is in maintaining a full scope of this thriving program. And I hope you keep us in mind. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Martin, Joyce, then Mary Jean. I don't think Martin's here anymore. Okay. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm Joyce Modi, Vice President of GROW, the nonprofit advocate for pea patches. We ask that City Council support the $3 million of sweetened beverage tax allocation in the Department of Neighborhoods budget to preserve and enhance pea patch community gardens. We have a crisis. So GROW is asking that council members earmark from the SBT $250,000 for Ballard pea patch toward their acquisition. 50,000 to Immaculate Pea Patch in the Central District for moving the garden that's going to be for sale next year. And I just found out last week, $75,000 to the Up Garden, the rooftop garden at Seattle Center Parking Garage for moving that garden that houses 90 Pea Patch plots. Displacement is due to the need for additional parking for the new arena, arena at Seattle Center. All three gardens are threatened with immediate displacement in 2020. Allocating funds to Ballard in early 2020 would help them demonstrate their commitment to raising funds to purchase the land and to use it as match for other grants and funding sources. This expenditure is bold and visionary but it's a gesture to preserve a community garden that has been highly successful and productive for 43 years. But it would also save more than just a place where 90 gardeners work the land. It would also preserve precious open space that functions as a community gathering place and a neighborhood park for future generations as the city grows. GROW also requests that the time frame for the use of the balance of the funds in this package be extended for three years because one year is too short for real community engagement, especially in communities that may require assistance to identify projects, submit a proposal, and organize to implement their projects. Thank you. Thank and you. And I'm going to give you this. Thank you, Joyce. Um, Mary Jean, Donald, and then Monserrat. Hi. Good morning, Council, and thanks for your time today. My name is Mary Jean Gilman, and I'm here on behalf of Ballard Pea Patch and in support of the one-time $3 million Pea Patch funding proposal from the sweetened beverage tax. Ballard Pea Patch's half acre has provided food security for thousands of people over the past 43 years. We want to increase our impact by continuing to mentor and advocate for this in our community, expanding our outreach, teaching, and partnerships. <coughs> we request, as before, that you specifically earmark $250,000 for our pea patch threatened with imminent sale and $50,000 for immaculate pea patch for relocation. Ballard pea patch will be sold in 2020 for $1.8 million. We need a down payment at the beginning of 2020 to show good faith to the seller and to leverage grants and private funding. Both Ballard and Immaculate provide food access and meet the funding criteria for the SBT. Ballard Pea Patch delivered 2,500 pounds of organic produce this year to Ballard Food Bank, and Ballard Food Bank has endorsed our campaign. We begin partnering with Finney Neighborhood Center's meal programs next year. Our request represents a very small por portion of the one-time funding windfall and even less of the total ongoing funding. As for appropriateness, I would like to um, call your attention to the recommendation that the Citizens Advisory Board made in, to the Council in June of 2019. Support for one-time investments in infrastructure that would increase the capacity of schools and community-based meal programs to offer fresh, fresher, minimally processed foods. And I think that describes what we provide. Please support and approve our request for earmarked funds and thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Um, Donald Moserat. I've been down a little while. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Afternoon. a father, I'm a grandfather. I worked 35 years in your construction trade. I have so many concerns. Your titles, I don't care about. Who you are as a person and the city that we built has me totally 
appalled. I don't have anything to do the rest of my life but sit and hold each and every one of you accountable. I don't have your PhD, nor have I the BA or the AA, but I do have a keen sense of common sense. Common sense. I listened at the y'all, I listened at the things that went transpired over the today. And when I hear there's $750,000 going somewhere, or, and I hear that, Lisa, you're asking for $19,000, there's something wrong with that picture. Because I say this because none of our kids are any better than the next. There's no color in here. This is all about being people. We are people first. If we were less our skin, we all bleed and look the same. And I have 48 seconds, and I'll be back tomorrow. I'm retired. But I will address those issues you won't talk about. I hear you tell them that, good job, good job. Well, we don't want to talk about what we're doing good. We want to find out what we're doing bad. Find out what we need to fix. And if it's fixed, we need to break it. Those people out here in these tents, they didn't get there by wanting to go there. They were well-to-do people. They were doctors. They were lawyers. They were everything that this city can produce. And with me having five kids and this city being as beautiful as it is, I am appalled at the way they may treat a type of person. I say that because I played by the rules. I'm 60 years old, and I have all the spunk in the world. And I tell you, I'll be back. I don't want you to be afraid of me. I want you to see me. Don's here. I mean to work with you. But I tell you, bringing the police to West Seattle won't be a good idea. You know why I say that? I say that because you put people like me out there. You give the community back to those kids. They may not talk to Bruce because Bruce can talk football. Donald, thank but you. They may talk to me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank I'll you very much. Monserrat? All right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Monserrat Padilla. I am the coordinator for the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network. We're a powerful statewide network with over 200 organizations who are working to build a defense line for immigrant and refugee communities whenever ICE comes knocking at the door. Uh, we have been able to build teams in 22 counties, 52 cities, and over the last couple of years, we've identified how immigration and custom enforcement, along with Custom Border Patrol, have been targeting and terrorizing our communities. Today, our communities continue to live in fear with ICE dollars that this administration has funded in Congress, as well as um, the rhetoric that this president expels into our communities, creating violence and fear. Um, I'm here to really recognize and appreciate the leadership of Councilmember Gonzalez, uh, for addressing the current needs that our communities are facing. Um, as we've all have seen, immigration has been a heated debate uh, through policy, through executive order, through congressional action. And so I'm here to remind us all of the national leader that we all can be in this moment. Um, I really want to thank the city of Seattle, uh, the city who has seen me grown since I was seven years old. I used to live <laughs> three blocks away from here when rent was $650. Uh, it's been a minute. Um, and I want to urge you all to uh, support a $750,000 budget allocation towards a rapid response fund. This rapid response fund will be used quickly to deploy immigration consultation clinics and resources around large scale changes in immigration laws, rules and po policy, including but not limited to deferred action for childhood arrival, temporary protective status for citizens of certain countries, the Social Security Administration no match letters, workplace rates and changes to public charge rules through the Department of State, Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice. Uh, just to give you a quick recap, um, there's over 18,000 DACA recipients residing here in Washington State, half of them living here in Seattle or the King County wide area. Last year, Immigration Custom Enforcement released an operation with over 5,200 workplace audits, and now over 250 Seattle workers, immigrant workers have been let go from their employment. Today, businesses and employers continue to feel threatened and continue to release everyday immigrant workers and families are being pushed into economic crisis and at the edge of homelessness. And so I ask that you all support uh, this budget allocation to ensure that we as a community are prepared for the next couple of months that will come, where immigration operation will only drastically increase until election day. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. So that ends public comment for today. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, colleagues, thank you. Um, 
We do not have any other items this afternoon until 5.30 when our public hearing begins. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And this part of the meeting is adjourned. Mm.